Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> at this time, the National Broadcasting Company is pleased to present another prayer in the busy schedule of this historic day. We are pleased to introduce Mr. DeWitt A. Davidson, past first reader of the Second Church Christ Scientist in New York. Mr. Davidson. Pray for the prosperity of our country and for her victory under arms that justice, mercy, and peace continue to characterize her government and that they shall rule all nations. Pray that the divine presence may still guide and bless our chief magistrate, those associated with his executive trust, and our national judiciary. Give to our Congress wisdom and uphold our nation with the right arm of his righteousness. In your peaceful homes, remember our brave soldiers, whether in camp or in battle. Oh, may their love of country and their faithful service thereof be unto them life preservers. May our Father, Mother God, who in times past hath spread for us a table in the wilderness and in the midst of our enemies, Establish us in the most holy faith. Plant our feet firmly on truth, the rock of Christ, the substance of things hoped for, and fill us with the life and understanding of God and goodwill towards men. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard a prayer read by Mr. DeWitt A. Davidson, past first reader of Second Church Christ Scientist in New York. This is Don Goddard in the NBC Newsroom in New York with the latest summary of the invasion news. At this hour, there is every evidence that the armies of General Eisenhower, with the support of the Allied fleets and air forces, actually are expanding their beachheads on the coasts of France. From present descriptions, that beachhead, or that series of beachheads, is roughly a crescent of land swinging from the port of Cherbourg eastward to the port of Le Havre around the estuary of the River Seine, where it joins the waters of the Channel. At last reports, this beachhead was about ten miles wide at its widest place at the spot of greatest attack, the city of Caen. There are German reports that the Allies also have landed on the Channel Islands of Jersey and Guernsey, but those reports are unconfirmed at this hour. An earlier Swedish report said that our points of landing numbered about twelve. This has not been confirmed either. The Germans, just heard by our monitors at NBC, also say that they expect new landings on the island of San Malo, another of the Channel Islands. And the latest report from our reconnaissance flyers, who already are piecing together several thousand pictures of the beachheads and producing evidence that our armies have secured their positions, are now in. And a bulletin at an Allied air base in England says that many Allied assault troops are now beyond the initial danger zone of total exposure in France. That also is a report from our reconnaissance flyers. The soldiers of the Allied nations have been on the shores of Europe for 12 hours and more now, and the Germans are beginning to come back with counter-assault at our beachheads. Just how heavy or how effective those counter-blows are is not clear. The Germans, in one breath, speak of meeting our armies along the whole 70 miles of French coastline where we've secured ourselves. They speak of dealing effectively with our parachutists, and they say they've taken many of them prisoner. They also say their big coastal guns have come into play and their fleets of fast e-boats and destroyers are in the Seine estuaries battling our navies. They claim they have sunk a cruiser and several landing barges. They are claiming no air successes to this point, however. They make these claims when at last they announced after nine hours of double talk on their domestic radio programs to the German people that this really looked like the invasion the Allies had been talking about. And then they began to explain how many ships and planes and men we'd thrown into the fray. They even admitted that we'd penetrated rather far inland, and a distance of 10 or 12 miles, they said. The Nazis undoubtedly are readying their counterattacks. They may actually have launched some, but thus far, considering the magnitude of their operations, the number of men and the 4,000 ships and 11,000 Allied planes involved, our casualties have been comparatively light. That is an official statement. And in most places, our men came ashore against little opposition, and the German Air Force was practically absent. In fact, our reconnaissance flyers report that we not only have secured our beachheads, but that some of our advanced spearheads 
are now penetrating southward, and they say, on the run. If they are, they're headed in the general direction of Paris, which lies only 125 miles to the south. A bulletin from London. German fighter planes have begun offering opposition now to Allied invasion forces. That's just in. Returning Allied pilots, uh, pilots report numerous dogfights between Allied typhoons and German Messerschmitts and Fokker Wolfs in the southeast battle area of the invasion coast. One of the contributing factors in our initial successes there on the northern shores of France undoubtedly is our overwhelming superiority in air power. Air power to the smothering point. 11,000 planes in action today as our troops swept ashore. So Prime Minister Churchill told the House of Commons this morning. And that, uh, that add that to the accumulated death and destruction from thousands upon thousands of sorties of our air blitz to date. Also, that concentrated attack, the heaviest yet in a limited area that the RAF laid on the path to invasion that our armies were to take a few hours after last night. Add another thousand plane attack by American heavy bombers along that coast this morning. And then add the hundreds to come. A bulletin from Stockholm, a Berlin dispatch of the Scandinavian Telegraph Bureau reports heavy fighting on both sides of Caen today and says additional Allied invasion forces have been seen off Caen and off Cherbourg. Undoubtedly reinforcements now being brought up. Yes, the Germans will react militarily as they did at Anzio, bitterly and with strength. Few observers doubt that at this hour. But we're ashore on the continent of Europe and we shall stay there. There seems little doubt of that either. One German reaction is that of Hitler himself. He was reported to be rushing to France today to try his intuition against the masterly planning of General Eisenhower and his commanders. Another bulletin from Washington, Admiral Royal E. Ingersoll has just now officially revealed that U.S. battleships, cruisers, and destroyers of the United States Navy are participating in the invasion of Western Europe. The news of the invasion in Western Europe gave an added impetus to our armies in Italy. Rome went wild with jubilation. A dispatch just received from Rome says that Allied troops have smashed five miles north of the Tiber River now. Sixteen miles east of Rome, Allied troops have captured a spot known as Tivoli Junction. To the west of the Holy City, near the mouth of the Tiber, American forces have cut off and captured a force of 2,000 Germans. And there are more reports that the enemy is bewildered, demoralized in their mad scramble northward. The armies of General Alexander are sweeping ahead along a front of 70 miles there in Italy and well north of Rome now. A late report from Washington, Soviet Ambassador Andrei A. Gromyko hails the opening of what he calls the Second Front, which Russia has so long demanded, and he predicts a speedy and a complete victory. In the first official Soviet reaction to the invasion news, the ambassador declares that he is confident that the combined blows of the powerful Allied coalition will ensure a speedy and complete victory over the enemy. The news of the invasion, he says, is good and encouraging. Romiko conveys the wishes of the Soviet people for all successes to our allies in this most important military undertaking, which is speeding up our common victory over the mortal enemy of mankind, Hitlerite Germany. And London war authorities have heard this morning that Russia herself is now about ready to strike the Germans in great strength from the east and will launch major offensives before this week is over. And President Roosevelt has just summoned the top leaders, the chiefs of his army and the navy and the air forces for a conference at the White House. And this afternoon, he will meet the newsmen for his regular Tuesday afternoon noon news conference. And I understand that we are now to have a special broadcast from Rome, a special broadcast which will be heard from, uh, from the city of London, rather, from our headquarters in London. If London is ready, we will call them in. They will be ready in just a moment. We understand that uh, one of our reporters is waiting over there, having just conferred with top leaders of the Allied armies. Go ahead, London. This is W.W. Chaplin in London. The first post-invasion press conference has just been held in a long, narrow, bowling alley sort of room in the Ministry of Information. And do you know one startling thing that has come out of that conference? Well, sir... The invasion of Europe from the West was originally planned for yesterday, not today. But the weather prophets came along and shook their fingers and wagged their heads, and they said, no, no, you can't have your invasion. Then, because the weather is going to be just 
awful. So, the generals took that dictum and they said, okay, they'd put off the invasion. The greatest amphibious operation in history, at least one day. And then what happened? Well, the next day, and that was yesterday, the weather was worse than ever. But those old weather prophets came barging out again and said, sure, it looks pretty terrible right now, but it's going to clear up fine. So the generals decided to let her go for last night, or rather early this morning. And sure enough, the weather cleared up and over they went. At this first press conference, sponsored by Shafe, which means Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, there were representatives of air, sea, and land forces. Nationality didn't count. As it doesn't count, in the actual military operations. Some of the men talking today were American and some were British, just as some of the men doing the fighting are American and some are British. And now, back to the newsroom in New York. Thank you, Bill Chaplin. That was Bill Chaplin from our headquarters in London telling us the latest invasion news in London. As he told you, the Allied landings in France were postponed 24 hours due to bad weather. That was learned today at Allied headquarters, and Bill has just been up there talking with the Supreme Commanders. And back here in this country, from every city and town in America today, the news is almost the same. There is relief that the tension is over, that D-Day has come at last, and the first reports are almost unbelievably favorable. But that relief is a sober relief, and if any joy is felt, it's tempered by the knowledge that American boys must die to liberate Europe in this greatest invasion which the world has ever seen. That's the temper and the spirit of America today as we feel it here in the newsroom, as we get it from the dispatches which are pouring in by the thousands of words here at NBC, describing the reaction in all communities, big and little, of the United States and of the world. But at least the waiting is over, and Americans have looked at each other and said, yes, this is it. And they could take some comfort from the words of Winston Churchill, that grand old phrase maker this morning, who told the House of Commons this morning that things were going according to plan, and he added, what a plan that is. Said Churchill, sighting the 4,000 ships and 11,000 planes, and our beachheads already driven into the Normandy Peninsula of France, yes, what a plan. And we could take comfort, too, from the knowledge that President Roosevelt sat up all night behind blacked-out windows of the White House, in constant touch with the situation, knowing when every naval vessel was launched, when every amphibious landing barge sheared onto the beaches of France. America's the Americans could take comfort in the fact that the president was praying along with them and that he was composing a prayer too as soon as he finished his radio address last night which he will ask Americans to intone with him when he speaks again tonight on the radio at 10 o'clock Eastern wartime. The president's secretary Stephen Early told this story to reporters in Washington this morning. He knew when the first barges started across the channel and he knew when they landed. He knew of other operations in just as great detail. And that prayer which President Roosevelt has composed has been released for publication this afternoon in order that the public may be familiar with it and be able to join in with the President. And in part, it goes like this. My fellow Americans, in this poignant hour, I ask you to join me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of the nation, this day have set up a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness to their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. And that is the NBC Newsroom in New York. This is Don Goddard speaking for NBC. We pause briefly for station identification. WEAF, New York. He now continues its full and complete coverage of the invasion. Here is Caesar Searchinger with his report on the news behind the news of the invasion to the moment. Mr. Searchinger. Good afternoon. I've uh, got a new a, uh, bulletin in just now which says, Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force, German opposition in all quarters was less than expected. It was learned at headquarters tonight, and an optimistic tone was evident. There's another bulletin which says that American warships, particularly one battleship, 
moved close in to the French shore and with the help of the air forces virtually silenced the coastal guns of the landing beaches. Now that's a very interesting story because one of the things that we always wondered about was what the coastal batteries would do to warships going in close to shore. The, the Germans have long told us about their terrific batteries, their terrific Atlantic wall that nothing could approach. Well, as a matter of fact, we did know uh, that the guns which manned that Atlantic war were largely guns taken from the French and from the Belgians. A good many of them came from the Maginot Line. And uh, the largest guns, stationary guns on the coast there, were 11 inches, from 6 to 11 inches. Now, you can see, of course, that they do not stack up against the uh, 11 to 16-inch guns of uh, battleships and cruisers. And the concentration on one of our cruisers is much greater than the Germans can put on, say, several miles of coast, unless they covered the whole down coast from uh, for a thousand miles with guns which sim simply do not exist. So that uh, the prognostications which we made some time ago about the strength of the German coastal batteries have come pretty well true. Uh, what, of course, is, we do not know yet is what really uh, happened on the beaches. And many things did happen, undoubtedly. We won't go into details now. We do know that as from the reports we have, that the Allies did crash the beaches, that they did get through the mines, that they did get through the mortars and the machine gun nests, and they must have got past a good many of the pillboxes, and they are well inland. Then, of course, we also know that our paratroopers went behind the lines and are attacking the fortifications from the other side. The big show, of course, will come further inland, may not come for some time, because it will come in the area which is... Uh, the fortifications and depth which provide for a large area for maneuvering and for an army of considerable size to be brought there over the railway lines that may be left. But we do know that not much is left of the railway net behind Harbour or any of the Channel Coasts. And that is, of course, the real uh, secret of our success, such as it is so far. Now, when the Allies invaded this morning... If we cast our eyes back a little bit over recent history, it is the last of a string of events that really ought to fill our hearts with pride. We go back to Pearl Harbor, 1941, December 7th. That was the beginning of it for us. For a year, nothing very much happened so far as we are concerned. But in October, in October 23rd, 1942, there was that Battle of El Alamein that broke the line that broke the, the Rommel, Rommel's defense in Africa. And it was followed by this tremendous thousand-mile retreat across North Africa. In, now, in November 8th, the Allies invaded North Africa with the greatest armada ever seen. On January 26th of 1943, the British took Tripoli, and in February 2nd, there was the victory at Stalingrad, the real turning point of the war, when the, the siege of Stalingrad was lifted. Well, the Battle of Europe proper, so far as we are concerned, began in July. On July 10th, the largest invasion, invasion force in history landed at Sicily. On July 25th, Mussolini fell, and on September 3rd, we invaded Italy. On sept September 8th, Italy surrendered, and then came that terrible Battle of Salerno, which was our first real experience in landing on a defended coast in Europe. It was a success, and Salerno proved, uh, proved the forerunner of what has happened this morning, the invasion of Western Europe. Well, to go a little further, on October 31, the leaders met at Moscow and planned the whole campaign and at Tehran, it was confirmed in November 26th. General Eisenhower already was in London, taking charge, and since then, the organization of the greatest invasion of all history has taken place. Then, of course, I should mention that six weeks ago, the casino offensive uh, opened, and on June 4th, two days ago, came the fall of Rome. Who would have thought on that day that only a day later, Two days later, 
would come the great news that we've all been waiting for. You may remember that on Saturday there was some false news. By some mistake, we were told that the invasion had already started, and then it had to be denied. I happened to be on the air just after that, and I called your attention to the fact that it happened to be the anniversary of Dunkirk, of that terrific battle on the beaches of Dunkirk when the British evacuated their army of 300,000 men, which in a way was also a turning point of the war and perhaps the day that saved civilization more than any other one day. Well, now I'd like to talk a little bit about the invasion coast. We don't know officially from the Allies where we have landed. The Germans say we have landed at Le Havre, and I've heard as many as 11 other points mentioned. Well, anywhere from Holland down to the end of Normandy is invasion coast. Calais, as you know, is the part of the coast that was most hardly hit by uh, the invasion bombardment, the air bombardment, which went on continuously for months and months. Well, Calais is also the place, the only place, where Europe was invaded across the Channel before. In 1347, over five centuries ago, the British landed near Calais and fought the Battle of Tracy and uh, then held Calais for 200 years. Europe was not invaded again from the West until 1809, when uh, the British landed near Flushing on the Dutch coast against Napoleon. But that invasion was decidedly not a success. The British couldn't even take Antwerp, and they had to leave again. Indeed, this is a historic day, for Europe has never been invaded in force from the West, or for that matter, from any part against a really defended coast. So this is really something that has never happened in history before. <clears throat> now, as I said before, the crisis will not come immediately. The crisis will come inland. That is what the generals have warned us about for some time. It will come after the Germans have discovered the main centers of our attack and have moved into their reserves and are ready to counterattack us in force. To delay and interfere with the assembling of a counterattacking army is therefore the next problem we have to deal with. The constant bombing of railroad centers along the western coasts during the past weeks and months was, in fact, the first stage of that tackling that problem. This will be followed by intensive tactical bombing of the transportation system as we go along. Of course, the, one of the remarkable things is that we did not meet more uh, opposition from fighters in the air. We had a tremendous cover, we can be sure of that, an uh, umbrella of fighters the whole time. But apparently the Germans did not come up. And that seems to confirm the suspicion that the German fighter force has been very badly de depleted. And, of course, that, in fact, gave us the cue as to when the invasion should take place. Then, of course, there is the employment of paratroops. That probably is taking place to an extent that has never taken place before. The Germans themselves reported that we had 80,000 of these troops in England ready for the invasion jump. This parachute corps will have the most difficult job of all. They'll be expected not only to dynamite road bridges and take uh, railroad junctions, but attack Nazi fortifications from the rear. If we have mastery in the air, and it seems that we will have from now on, the number of these troops can be increased almost at will. They'll have no heavier to artillery, but the Germans themselves have shown how fortifications can be taken by sappers armed with hand grenades and dynamite. In 1940, you may remember, they took the famous uh, Fort Emile in Belgium, and that was supposed to be impregnable with a loss of only seven men. Now, the first real test of the invasion will come when we are perhaps 20 or more miles inland, that is, beyond the range of our naval guns. Assuming that Rommel will have had time to assemble his field army, it will be a test that we have not met before, either in Sicily or at Salerno. 
And, uh, of course, the best, the more nearest test was at Salerno and at the Anzio beachhead, which now is no longer a beachhead, but part of the triumphant army that has entered Rome. Now, there doesn't seem to be anything later than I've already told you, because the uh, Allies are keeping mum on what's happened. All that we know is uh, what the Germans tell us but we might tell you a little bit about what the Germans' prospects are of holding back our invasion. The Germans have made a great deal of the theory of the interior lines. They say that they have the advantage in the fortress Europe because they have the interior lines. He who operates on interior lines, of course, has an important asset. Uh, but consequently, the idea that Germany's central position in relation to her opponents will be an intrinsic advantage in the coming struggle uh, seems to be general. Well, uh, it's obvious that in most cases a military machine which can radiate its power from a central reservoir to the circumference, switching its principal concentration to given points at will, is in a superior position to its opponents. The latter must diffuse their resources among, so to say, a ring of reservoirs. Instead of using a radius, they can only swing their power from one point to another by following the long curve of the circumference. Allied aid to Russia goes all the way around by the Arctic or through Persia. It's a matter of elementary geometry. But this proposition is not always true and under all conditions. If a centrally situated antagonist enjoys overall superiority in weight, he can bring bar power to bear wherever he chooses and so demolish his opponents piecemeal. If he is approximately equal to them in weight, interior lines are still a substantial advantage because he can affect any necessary concentration more rapidly. But what if he is inferior in numbers, in air and sea power? In that situation, the fact that he is inside a circumference, which he must maintain, is a deadly disadvantage because he is pinned down at every point on the circle, whereas his opponents are free to exploit the latest advantages of exterior lines by hitting everywhere at once, if they so choose. That is the position of Germany and the Allies, respectively, today. A bulletin has just been handed to me to the effect that General William Hanstein, Commander-in-Chief of the Norwegian Underground, broadcast an order to all organized fighting groups inside Norway today to be prepared to take part in the great settlement. Anstein told his uh, countrymen that they would receive orders on what to do. You must not act openly except in conjunction with the Allied military plan and not before orders have been issued from here. That would seem to indicate that we might have an invasion in Norway as well as in France. It also opens the question of all the other undergrounds, along the invasion coast, and particularly the French underground. What is the French underground doing? And what have the Allies done to encourage the French underground and to, beyond the instructions given by Eisenhower, to organize themselves and uh, go to bat? Now, there's one little fly in the ointment. And so far as we know as yet, there has been no agreement made with General de Gaulle about the underground, the disposition of the underground, and... The, uh, and what is to be done about the government of France in the rear of the invasion. However, it is reported that General de Gaulle is in London now, and we hope that this problem may also be solved before long. Good afternoon. We announce a special feature of the NBC coverage of the invasion. Tonight at 8.30 over... Station WNBT, NBC Television, will bring you a program featuring H.V. Kaltenborn and a special Signal, signal Corps pre-invasion film, WEAF, New York. From our NBC newsroom in New York, we take you now to NBC in Washington. This is Morgan Beatty speaking to you from the radio gallery of the United States Senate in Washington, where it's not exactly business as usual today, although there is a familiar routine in the air. A few moments ago, the presidential buzzer rang, denoting a list of nominations to public office, nominations that are not news on a day like D-Day. The House convened first at 11 o'clock, 
Instead of the usual prayer, the members themselves stood with heads bowed in silent prayer. Out in the house corridor, they carefully prepared maps of Colonel Lawrence Martin of the Library of Congress for the center of attention. Groups of representatives discussed the invasion, even as you and I. And one representative noticed the direct route to Paris ahead of our forces and said, wouldn't it be fine if they could move right into the capital of France? Speaker Rayburn stopped me on the way over to the Senate gallery to say he couldn't be with us as he had hoped. He has a luncheon date with the president today. Here in the Senate, the Senate, uh, the session opened at noon, just about a half hour ago, but most senators were in committee meetings. Not more than a handful were on the floor. And for the first time in many a moon, the Senate chaplain, Dr. Frederick Brown Harris, did not have his opening prayer all typed out in advance for the reporters. He spent much more time than the regular period preparing today's message. Here is part of his prayer. We pray today, he said, this day of days for our enemies with calloused hearts and warped minds and poisoned conceptions. Forgive them. They know not what they do. Bring them to last with purged spirits in the united family of nations. And now, ladies and gentlemen, there are several senators and representatives with us today, and the first of them is Senator Bennett Clark of Missouri, a veteran of the last war, you may remember. He spends most of his time these days working on veterans' legislation, legislation for the men who today are going ashore in Europe on the greatest invasion effort of all time. Senator Clark, you know, is author of the G.I. Bill of Rights, now in the Senate, and while a soldier, incidentally, you may remember that he and Teddy Roosevelt, Jr. organized the American Legion. Won't you tell us something about that, Senator Clark, and give us some message for today? Mr. Brady, in this moment of destiny, when our boys are jumping off in the greatest military adventure of all time, the American people may have the satisfaction of knowing that our army comprises the best trained, the best equipped, best armed, best fed, and the best clothed army that the United States has ever sent into action. I know we're all glad of that, Senator. Thank you very much, sir. And now I see Congresswoman Claire Booth Luce of Connecticut. She's wearing that new hairdo, by the way, the one with the braids. Mrs. Luce, would you say something for us today? This is the hour that marks the beginning of the battle for the world. We know that this is the true name for the battle, for if we were to lose it, we'd lose our supreme chance to lead in the councils of peace and to guide our nations towards a brighter destiny. We will win this battle for the world. There's no one in our nation who doubts it, because we know that our arms are strong and our hearts are firm, and there is faith in our souls. In this moment of faith and victory for our arms, I find myself thinking not so much of our men who have crossed the channel or who are still to cross. I'm thinking of the mothers and fathers and wives who wait and listen and listen and wait at home. How heavy and cold is the fear in each heart for the dear one. How time drags and crawls and creeps and yet will not stand still until some news of him of that one boy, of that one man comes to you. A mother or a father or a woman in love dies a thousand deaths a day waiting and listening. The other women have known the cruel pain of that long vigil that now faces you. They can only tell you this, believe in God, accept his will with love. Your man's fighting well for his country, his weapons are of the best, his leaders in the field are tough and wise, and the one thing that he would want is for you at home to be of good cheer so that you in your courage may set as fine an example as he is setting among his own comrades today in arms. Thank you, Mrs. Luce. Yours is the honor of interpreting for all of us the reactions of mothers throughout the United States. Now I wanted to Senator Alban Barkley of Kentucky, who has sons in this war, would speak a word to you today. I'm sure that everybody in the United States, if not everybody in the world, has been thrilled this morning by the news of our invasion of Europe. I feel sure that All of the impatience which may have been exhibited prior to this date will fade when we consider 
that it has been the duty of our government and of our allied governments to prepare for this invasion to the last man, the last tank, the last airplane, the last round of ammunition, in order that when we made the adventure, we should go forward in it. I can only say, as I feel the same suspense that must be felt by millions of parents all over the United States, we should fervently and devoutly pray, deep down in our hearts, that the God of justice and of peace may bring victory to our troops and to those of our allies at the earliest possible moment. And I might conclude this brief comment by quoting from an old church hymnal which I learned when I was a boy. This is the hour I long have sought and mourned because I found it not. Thank you, Senator Barkley. I myself, a veteran of many years on the Hill, not as many as you, of course, have seen this spirit of prayer among the representatives and senators of our nation. It's one of the most inspiring hours of my career on, hi on the Hill at any rate. And now, Senator White of Maine, the minority leader, the leader for the Republicans, the opposition on Capitol Hill on the Senate side. Senator, would you say a word for us today? Mr. Beatty, this is one of the momentous days in the world's history. It is shadowed with a possibility of disaster, but it has within it the substantial promise of a glorious ending. Wherever the men and the women of our country may be this day, they fight, they work, and they pray for victory, for justice, for peace, with all the blessings which these will bring to the peoples of the earth. We have abiding faith that in his appointed time, the God of battles and the God of peace will give triumphant victory to the right and will worst the forces of evil. Thank you, Senator White of Maine. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be interested to know that our guests here today, most of them are speaking to you right out of their hearts and minds. They haven't prepared anything. They've just come by the Senate Radio Gallery to speak a word at our request. And now, Senator Lester Hill of Alabama, who you may know is a war veteran and has long been head of the uh, House Military Committee in years gone by. Senator Hill. Our invasion constitutes the most stupendous military task ever undertaken in all the history of the world. It's not possible for us today to know the infinite preparation, the careful and detailed plans that have been made for this invasion. Senator, may I interrupt with a yes. bulletin at this time? Sure. Go ahead, Mr. We have a bulletin from Supreme Allied Headquarters, Expeditionary Force. It says... Our forces have, by evening of this day, gotten over the first five or six hurdles in the greatest amphibious assault of all time. Now, Senator Hill again. This is good news that we've made such progress. We can be thankful that we have made such progress. But we must all be prepared for terrific counterattacks that will be made by the Germans. I was speaking of the plans that have been made, the infinite preparation for this invasion. We can't know these plans now, but I think as a member of the Senate Committee on Military Affairs, I can say to the mothers and fathers of our young men and young women who are struggling on the beaches today that our military and naval commanders have taken every possible precaution, have done everything humanly possible to protect and save every life they can to keep hold every body that they can. Today we salute these heroic young men and young women. And for us it should be an hour of dedication, an hour in which we dedicate ourselves to the one thought and the one purpose that we here at home will do that which will best support, best sustain, and best back up these heroic young men and young women, and that we will also resolve that we will play our part in the building of a peace so that the sacrifices that our young men and young women are making today will not be made in vain. Thank you, Senator Hill of Alabama. We've now heard from several of our representatives on the Hill and our senators 
The important message, I think, that all of them gave us, the main thing they stressed, is the fact that America goes into this war prepared. I think all of them, pardonably, must be thanked for the effort they made to be sure that the armed services got everything they asked for in the war effort in the last two years. Never before in history has so much money been given to the Army and the Navy. Never has so much cooperation and unified spirit moved the efforts of Congress despite many, many arguments on the sidelines as time went on. Today we've heard Congresswoman Claire Booth Luce speaking for the mothers of the nation, speaking the message that they would have, most of them, if they were here with us today. And now we have a bulletin from London. It says that Hermann Goering has issued an order of the day to the German air forces that the invasion of Western Europe must be fought off, even if it means the death of the Luftwaffe. Ladies and gentlemen, that would seem to be the beginning of preparations for the German counterattack. As Senator Hill told us a few moments ago, we must be prepared for terrific counterattacks by the Germans. They have not yet launched any such attacks. As a matter of fact, most of the congressmen and the senators I've talked to this morning have said, oh, how well it would be if we could only expect them to move right on in there. But we all know it can't be that way. The counterattack is the thing that's coming, and the counterattack in this particular zone of Europe, where the Germans are much closer to supply lines than we are, have not the hurdle of water to cross. That counterattack must be expected. That's why most of the men who spoke to you this morning, who know their map of Europe, who studied specially the strategy of this situation in the European area, they know that great losses are ahead of us in the next few moments. That's all for now from the Capitol in Washington. We return you just a moment, just a moment. We have a bulletin from London. Kenneth Banghart with a new bulletin. A bulletin from the NBC newsroom in Washington. It's just been announced in London by Prime Minister Winston Churchill that uh, Allied troops have penetrated several miles inland at some points after landings on the French coast. And now we return you to the NBC newsroom in New York. Back in the NBC newsroom in New York, and here is Don Goddard with more news flashes. Winston Churchill has just made a second appearance before the House of Commons in London, and he has had this to say about the events of the day's invasion. He says, I can state that this operation is proceeding in a thoroughly satisfactory manner. He says this also to members of the House of Commons. Many dangers and difficulties which this time last night appeared extremely formidable are now behind us. The passage of the sea has been made with far less loss than we apprehended. Those are the words of Winston Churchill speaking before the House of Commons in London at a second meeting today. Mr. Churchill had gone before the House of Commons earlier today and had told of the great armada of ships, the great fleets of airplanes which we were sending over to secure our beachhead. He told us then, you remember, that the astronomical figure of 11,000 planes had been used, that 4,000 ships were standing in the channel, great warships bombarding the coast where our men were landing. And he said today, later on, coast artillery, that is the Germans' coast artillery in defense, was far less effective than anticipated. And our headquarters are saying that the invasion was made possible only through the excellent work of minesweepers. Rough weather marked the start of the undertaking, and several landing barges were swamped. The German forces resisting the Allies are believed to be under the command of Nazi Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the spokesman at headquarters said. He expressed the belief that the Germans have between 15,000 and 1,500 and 2,000 fighter planes available when they want to use them against our fleet of 11,000 planes. The Allied High Command revealed today that the invasion of Western Europe originally was scheduled to take place yesterday, but had to be postponed for 24 hours because of the bad weather. This is Don Goddard speaking from the NBC Newsroom in New York. We pause briefly now for station identification. This is WEAF New York. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, the National Broadcasting Company takes you across country 
with stop-offs at other key NBC news points for a roundup of the domestic reaction on this greatest military story of all time. NBC newsmen are now at their microphones in Cleveland, Chicago, Denver, Hollywood, and San Francisco. We shall hear from them in that order. And so for a close-up of what the nation is thinking and feeling this very momentous day, NBC in New York switches you across the continent. For our first report, we take you to NBC in Cleveland. This is Edward Wallace in Cleveland. Here in the nation's fifth largest city, the people met the news of invasion with a spirit of quiet determination. Like the rest of the nation, most Clevelanders were asleep when the first word came. But in Cleveland's war plants, the news reached the war workers at the moment it was first announced. Radio loudspeakers brought the first bulletins to them. Work halted briefly. Only a few cheered, but most of them just stood quietly by their lace, offering a short prayer for the safety and victory of their loved ones. Then back to their vital war jobs with fresh vigor. The same spirit pervades the crowds on Cleveland streets. No cheers or any similar outburst. Here outside the NBC building, for instance, a crowd of men and women has been growing ever since the first word of the invasion came from Europe early this morning. They've been standing there for hours, listening to each bulletin as it comes through the NBC loudspeakers. Their faces are somber, and they are following each development with serious intentness. One woman spoke the mood of most Clevelanders. She's got a boy over in England, a signal corpsman, and it's probable that he was part of the invasion force that stormed ashore on the coast of Normandy. Her reaction to invasion? It's this. I've asked God to give us victory and take care of my son, and I know he will. All over Cleveland and in other parts of Ohio, too, church doors have swung open and the people are taking time out of their day-to-day -day duties for prayer and meditation. Mayor Lausche of Cleveland was one of the public officials with a special message for the people. Said Lausche, The command to us is to stand forth and stay at our civilian posts with increased vigor and devotion. We must humbly and solemnly pray for our youth. They are in a gigantic and perilous task and need every bit of help that we can give. And then he attended an early church service before he, too, went to work. Ohio's governor, John Bricker, calls today the beginning of the end for the forces of evil. And in the little towns around Cleveland and elsewhere in Ohio, special prayers are being offered up to hasten that end. And in the schools also, the children bowed their heads in special prayers. High up on top of Ohio's tallest building, the railroad terminal tower in Cleveland, a symbol was hoisted today. It's a 30-foot banner of black and gold, flying briskly under the stars and stripes. It was designed by the Cleveland Civilian Defense as a herald of the invasion. It will stay there until the invasion has succeeded. This is Edward Wallace in Cleveland. I switch you now to NBC in Chicago. This is Alex Dreyer speaking. Chicago's usually noisy loop was calm today. There were no excited groups on street corners, no newsboys shouting the advent of D-Day. Hotel lobbies were strangely silent, and everywhere Chicagoans received the momentous news soberly and with a prayer on their lips. Governor Green of Illinois and Mayor Kelly of Chicago both have proclaimed this a day of prayer. And churches of all denominations are holding special services throughout the day. As early as 5 a.m. Central Time, the bells began pealing their summons for early masses in the Roman Catholic churches. And as dawn was breaking, many men and women in overalls returning from their work on the night shifts entered their churches to pray. Brief special prayer services were arranged quickly in many of the larger defense plants. And it was the same throughout the Middle West. The bells of the old cathedral at Vincennes, Indiana, the first church in the Northwest Territory, rang out early this morning. Chicago's spirit of prayerful determination was reflected in other ways, too. Absenteeism in war plants, large and small, fell to a new low, and everywhere workers followed the news of the invasion eagerly, speeding up their work as they did. At the huge Dodge Chrysler plant, largest airplane motor plant in the world, NBC's latest invasion bulletins were posted on the bulletin boards for passing employees to read. To the military in the Chicago area, however, today was just another day in the war, to be devoted, as always, to ordinary duty. At Fort Sheridan, only the guards knew of the attack. The rest of the post slept. And the thousands of sailors at Great Lakes, Illinois, awakened with the usual grumbling of the bugler's call. But they gave forth with cheers and shouting when the mess hall loudspeaker blared out Eisenhower's official announcement that the invasion was finally on. 
Chicago and the Middle West have taken the news calmly. But the little city of Linton, Indiana, could only sit and wait, because shortly after the invasion flash last night, the power generator in Linton blew out, cutting off all teletypes and radios in the community. The hope of many throughout the Midwest was probably expressed best by a little incident in an all-night Chicago restaurant. Upon hearing the invasion flash, a blonde in a sweeping pale blue formal gown bowed her head in a moment of prayer. And at the next table, the woman said, Now, Sammy, will be back home pretty soon. We take you now to NBC in Denver. This is Ivan Schooley in Denver. The news of the Allied invasion of Western Europe was taken calmly and quietly in Denver and other sections of the Rocky Mountain region. Since the news came when most people had retired for the night, many were not informed of the invasion until this morning, although sirens were blown in many cities as soon as the Allied command officially confirmed the landings. The siren served as a signal to many churches throughout the area to open church doors for prayers for the success of the Allied operations. Radio stations gave night-long reports on bulletins detailing the early announcements, and many newspapers put out special editions. Switchboards at radio stations were swamped with callers asking if the news was true. In Denver, when the official announcement came, only a few midnight stragglers were on the streets. However, in most hotels, the news electrified guests, although there were no demonstrations. Larry Martin, editor of the Denver Post, in analyzing the importance of this new action, pointed out that the magnitude of the Allied invasion staggers the imagination. He emphasized the fact that United Nations armies had successfully negotiated their first hurdle. However, he warned that the most difficult days are coming. A Denver street cleaner, weighed down by knee-high boots, stopped his work long enough to tell how he felt about the invasion. He said one of his sons is probably in it. He's been in England for months. And the cleaner added, I'll keep sweeping the streets and let him sweep into Berlin. At Lowry Field, an army base near Denver, Air Force ground school trainees stopped on their way to mess to pray for buddies who might be in the invasion vanguard. Special D-Day services were held. Then, the soldiers continued with their regular duties, as did military personnel at other camps. Across the Continental Divide in Salt Lake City, the invasion news was received calmly, and the man on the street seemed little surprised. Everyone, apparently, has just been waiting for the big push to start. Persons interviewed were unanimous in predicting success for the Allied Expeditionary Forces. Response to the word of the satisfactory progress of the landings in France was highlighted in war plans by comments in the Denver factories making landing craft. Workers expressed the hope that landing boats they had a part in making were in on the big event. Although there was tremendous interest in news of the invasion, war workers stuck to their jobs and worked with increased enthusiasm. And those are the highlights in the Rocky Mountain region of the response to announcement of the invasion of Europe. This is Ivan Schooley in Denver. Now to NBC in Hollywood. First, we have a late bulletin from the Berlin radio. Berlin has just admitted that the beachhead on the European shores has been further widened. Local reaction in Southern California was what you'd expect of any American community. No hysterical rejoicing, pretty calm and quiet on the whole. No apathy, certainly not that, but a dignified and solemn acceptance of news awaited a long time. The impulse is definitely toward prayer, the general feeling Anxiety for the men who have history's toughest job. The three questions on everybody's lips are, how are we doing, where are we doing it, and what about casualties? Quite a few people went to church this morning who haven't been to church in a long time, and special services are scheduled throughout the day. Grown-ups, pretty solemn about it all, are hanging close to their radios wherever possible. When the first news broke at war plants in Los Angeles, including Lockheed and Douglas, the workers cocked an ear to the announcement and then redouble their efforts to turn out planes. Their feeling is one of tremendous responsibility. They've got a personal interest in those 11,000 planes which are covering the invasion attack. And in the back of most everybody's mind in this area is the thought, every mile closer to Berlin means we're another mile closer to Tokyo, too. Even the children have that idea. One little girl awoke to the blare of neighborhood loudspeakers and asked, uh, What's all the noise about, Mother? Have we got those Japs where they belong? A number of Southern Californians slept through the whole thing. There weren't many reports of sirens and ringing of bells, 
Most Hollywood streets show either people with bloodshot eyes, the ones who've had their ears glued to a loudspeaker all night, or those with a quicker step who received the momentous news upon awakening this morning. All faces, tired and rested, show relief from tension. In, in studio language, the typical Hollywood reaction was a double take. People heard the news and then about two minutes later came up with startled faces and shouted, Huh? What? Here in Hollywood, one Marine who had just won a nightclub jitterbug contest. And all he said when he heard of the invasion announcement was, I feel kind of silly. Most folks seem to feel that way who didn't have some kind of part to play, such as aircraft workers have in this community. We're all thinking about those planes which have come off Southern California's assembly lines and which now are darkening the skies over Hitler's Europe. The prayers of this part of the coast are riding the wings of the planes our workers built. The planes our sons are flying into that inferno over there. All we can say is, God speed and God bless our boys. This is NBC in Hollywood. We take you now to NBC in San Francisco. This is Larry Smith speaking from San Francisco. I have just returned from a tour of the restaurants, the streets, and a short ride on a trolley car taking war workers to their jobs. To most San Franciscans, the invasion of the European continent was several hours old when they received the first word, because we are three hours late getting up, the New Yorkers and the East Coast residents. But now, everywhere in this great port of embarkation, the funnel through which the tools of war and the men to work them flow into the far reaches of the Pacific, there seems to be one calm but understandable reaction. That is, that this is the first step toward the day when the full might of the Allies can be hurled against our other mutual enemy, Japan. It's an understandable reaction because the men in uniform here are headed for New Guinea, for the Philippines, at least someplace across the Pacific where they will face the Japanese. A leathery-faced Marine, campaign ribbons filling three rows above his breast pocket, turned to me and said, Well, it had to happen, so what's all the shooting about? Didn't General Eisenhower say that it would be over in 1944? A young girl aboard the car, a girl in the metal hat of a shipyard worker, started to sob. Her husband is a paratrooper somewhere in England. That's where his last letter came from. Today, he's perhaps somewhere in France. A Chinese smiled. He saw in the defeat of Hitler the transfer of Allied power to help his staggering homeland. And Chinatown leaders started early this morning to build up a record sale of invasion bonds next week to speed the day of liberation for their country. An elderly woman stood up in the streetcar to announce proudly, my boy is with General Eisenhower's forces. He'll be in the fight. Almost everyone saw the invasion of Hitler's European fortress as a forerunner of a stepped-up war against the Japanese. And that, too, is understandable because the Pacific coast faces the enemy to the west rather than to the east. There is a general feeling that Russia will now enter the war against the Japs, that Stalin will grant the United States air bases, that we will invade the Kuril. Wild rumors run rampant, but beneath the surface, the reaction was simply, let's go, General Eisenhower, because the quicker the defeat of Hitler, the quicker we can get at Hirohito. Yes, San Franciscans this morning feel they can hear the sizzling of that rising sun of Japan, as it sinks into the torrent of righteous justice and retribution. They see the day when the Pacific will again be the Pacific. We return you to the NBC Newsroom in New York. This is Don Goddard back in the NBC Newsroom in New York, and New York, the nation's metropolis. The news of the invasion was greeted here with calmness, too, with a spirit of prayer and with a full awareness of the meaning of this momentous occasion in history. Typical, perhaps, was the reaction of some 500 men and women at work in war production at their benches at the Bendix Aviation Corporation's plant over in Brooklyn. There, in the dark hours of this morning, they heard that news with a lusty cheer, and then they returned to their task to turn out more implements of war to carry on the great effect, uh, offensive. And the New York stock market reflected the confidence of American business in these parts. The market was quiet, and U.S. Treasury bonds held steady as a rock. And New York's racetracks were closed today, along with others throughout the country. In the Times Square district, where soldiers and sailors on fur furlough were still entertaining, 
themselves and their girlfriends. There the servicemen stood in front of loudspeakers hearing the news over the radio. And one sailor said, I wish I'd been there myself. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard the story of how the news of the invasion came to the United States of America, the reaction on the home front from stations in Cleveland, Chicago, Denver, Hollywood, San Francisco, and here from Don Goddard in the NBC newsroom in New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Some of the dangers and the difficulties which appeared at this time last night extremely formidable, are already behind us. Passage of the sea was made with far less loss than was anticipated. The resistance of coastal batteries was greatly weakened by our bombing. In fact, it was weakened more than we had expected. And then the superior bombardment of our warships which lent such valiant aid to our invading forces, quickly reduced the power of these batteries to such small dimensions that they did not affect our landing problem. The Allied landing forces have already penetrated several miles inland from several points on the French coast. Our airborne troops have captured several strategic bridges intact and are holding them pending the arrival of our mechanized forces. Fighting is proceeding for the possession of the city of Caen, one of the most important of Normandy, its chief rail center. The Allied invasion forces everywhere met less resistance than expected. And this is true in the approaches to the beachheads as well as in the air. The Germans told us in a bulletin just a few minutes ago that our invasion beachheads have been further widened. And an observer at Allied headquarters summed up the situation in these words. We have gotten over the first five or six hurdles. Supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force tells us that the Allied landings in France were postponed 24 hours due to bad weather. They were originally scheduled for yesterday morning, which might suggest that they were intended to be timed with the capture of Rome, for that would have started the invasion within 24 hours of the capture by Allied forces of the Eternal City. Our bombing effort, reached a new climax yesterday and today. Some 2,300 United States and British bombers dropped 11,200 tons of bombs in eight and one-half hours. They were dropped on gun emplacements guarding the invasion coast. You must look to that air bombardment for a part of the explanation of our unexpectedly rapid progress in these first invasion stations. Despite this effort, the Allied Air Forces maintained effective air coverage for our troops and for our naval forces. Remember, we have 11,000 first-line planes in Britain, and every one of them is swinging into action today. The first German fighter plane opposition to the invasion forces was reported this afternoon. There were many dogfights. It came at the very moment when Marshal Goering told his Luft forces this invasion must be fought off, even if it means the death of the Luftwaffe. That's not an optimistic statement to present to a defensive fighter force at this stage of the invasion. The British Prime Minister also announced this afternoon that the Allies had captured a number of important bridges. And he also said that the airborne landings were on a scale far larger than anything seen so far in the world. The Germans told us that we had landed four divisions of airborne troops. Yank, the paper published, uh, no, Stars and Stripes, not Yank, the paper published in Naples tells us that we landed 30,000 paratroopers. Well, that would be the better part of the fighting force of four divisions. That of course, is by far the largest number of troops 
ever landed from the air. The great invasion of Crete, which was a classic in paratroop landings, included only one division. And so here, our initial effort, four times as great and more to come. Admiral Ingersoll revealed in Washington that United States battleships, cruisers, and destroyers are participating in the invasion. It is their bombardment, theirs and that of the British warships, that has helped to silence many of these coastal batteries on which the Germans relied to hold off the invasion ships. The Germans claim that one cruiser was sunk, which is a mighty small claim when you consider the tremendous naval force that is involved in this action. Some may ask, why France instead of Belgium or Holland or Norway or Denmark? France is the beginning. France is nearest. France has been softened up. France has a strong underground. These are reasons enough for us to make our beginning in France. It's curious that in this invasion, some of the best news comes to us from the Nazis. The Paris Radio said tonight, a vicious battle is raging north of Rouen between powerful allied paratroop formations and German anti-invasion forces. These paratroops, the Paris Radio says, landed behind the Atlantic wall defenses. That is the encouraging thing, that our invasion technique has sufficed to put us behind that great Atlantic defense wall on which Hitler relied. This battle in Rouen is something that we have had no word of from Allied sources, but it's quite possible to remember that we have landed in the estuary of the Seine. That was announced early today, and Rouen is somewhat farther inland, a hundred miles down the Seine, and is, of course, a tremendously important point. No, not a hundred miles. Rouen must be something like 40 miles down the Seine from the harbor where we landed early this morning. 31,000 Allied airmen were over France from midnight to 8 a.m., and that does not count parachute and glider troops. The conference of the High Command in Washington with President Roosevelt has ended. Admiral King, commander of the United States fleet, said after the conference with the president that the invasion of Europe is doing all right so far. And Admiral King is a conservative commentator. And so, as you look at the picture, you see everywhere initial allied success. You see the result of the careful preparation of these past two three years. You see the result of our experience in Sicily, in Africa, in Italy. We have learned, and what we have learned, we are putting into practice today. We have accumulated the necessary force. We have developed the necessary technique. Yes, there may be setbacks. There may be delays. But the story of these first hours of invasion tells us what we know in our hearts, that we are sure of victory and that it may come sooner than many of us had supposed. Good afternoon. The National Broadcasting Company now presents Lieutenant Colonel James Stevenson, United States Army retired, a military analyst who looks upon our invasion operation from a background of personal experience. For before his retirement, he was a member of the staff of that command which helped train our troops for the amphibious operations which they've undertaken today across the channel, the direct assault on France. We present Colonel Stevenson. Well, now that the invasion has actually started and action seems to be moving rapidly, it is rather difficult to make out exactly where the spearhead is striking. But that is unimportant. The latest reports indicate that the landing at La Ha was a major stroke. Our troops are moving in quickly and fanning out. It appears that we have made a serious threat to the German right flank in the defense of the long French Atlantic coast line. As this action proceeds, I believe you will see more landings along this coastline, for here are the huge harbors and docking facilities 
that we must have to maintain a great force of men in Europe. Great West Coast ports with docking and railroad facilities that we need to supply a great army. We used those facilities in the last war, and we need them again. Without them, we are pinched for room to operate. With them, we have breathing space and a chance to organize our great land forces for the push toward the east. As the great beachhead at Laha develops and we push further inland, we offer more and more a threat to the Nazi defenses along the coastline. There will be only one way for the Germans to save themselves, and that will be to draw back. Otherwise, they will take the chance of being pocketed along that west coast. And as they draw back, back toward their inner defenses, they will find the roads difficult because they do not run parallel to each other as in Germany. Oh, no. The French roads radiate from central points, which is natural to France's terrain. The country is laid out as in layers, something like saucers, one on top of the other, the bigger saucers on the bottom. And each rim is a natural obstacle to get over. And it is because of the natural terrain that the Allied command must have those West Coast ports. Now, there's been some speculation that there might be an invasion from the south, from the Mediterranean. I do not believe it is necessary, for as our forces drive down from Normandy, where they landed today, and as they move into the West Coast ports, the Nazis will be compelled to pull out of the south to save themselves. Their only other alternative is to be trapped against the Alps Mountains in the east where the few roads will not be sufficient to allow escape. So in all probability, the action within the next few days will develop south from La Ha in fast, bold strokes, with new landings to be made on the Atlantic or Bay of Biscay coast. There is the possibility that we will try to move down to Paris, about 110 miles away, as quickly as possible, for its psychological effect, just as we drove up the long, rocky Italian coast to take Rome, the prestige and the happy effect it would have upon all the shackled people of Europe would be invaluable because we must remember that part of our strategy is to get these people actively working for and supporting our forces. But the important thing now is getting those West Coast ports, squeezing the Nazis out of that part of France. And the action seems to indicate that that is exactly what we're doing. We must remember that armies need tremendous amounts of supplies and that everything which is being done now is based on that fact. We must get the docks. We must get the harbors. And our forces are driving down from La Ha to ensure that we do get them. The Nazi-operated Paris radio, quoting a last-minute flash from the battlefield, says that a vicious battle is raging north of Rouen between powerful Allied paratroop formations and German anti-invasion forces. The Paris radio says, these paratroops landed behind the Atlantic wall defenses. And further indicating tougher going, here's a bulletin which says, a bulletin from London, Reich Marshal Hermann Goering, in an order of the day, told Nazi airmen that the invasion must be fought off, even if it means the death of the Luftwaffe. Earlier, though, Prime Minister Winston Churchill in his second report to Commons today on the Allied invasion of Western Europe, said that on the basis of the latest information from the front, and I'm quoting him now, I can state to the House that this operation is proceeding in a thoroughly satisfactory manner. And even the German DNB agency said at 6.30 p.m. London time that the invasion has further widened. According to the German version this morning, then several landings were made both east and west of La Ha. They are expecting more landings to the west, and well they may. The action will develop to the south and west until the Germans are driven east toward Paris and the Belgian frontier from which they came. Thank you, Colonel Stevenson. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you a military analysis of our invasion operations by Lieutenant Colonel Stevenson, USA retired, an expert on amphibious operations. On this historic D-Day, the day of invasion, the news comes thick and fast in the early hours of this morning, at a time when most of the nation slept. It was then, for instance, that we got the exciting report from Merrill Muller, NBC's correspondent at General Eisenhower's headquarters, of how the correspondents themselves were brought up to date on the operation. 
And for the benefit of those who did not hear that broadcast, NBC now presents a transcription of the historic report. If I never attend another press conference in my life, I shall certainly remember this one. Perhaps because its outstanding factor was that it was more like a staff conference than a general talk to newspaper men. Here's the picture. Remember that all around us, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of men were readying themselves for the outbreak of the battle that all the world had waited for for four long, dark years. Men from the far corners of the world, ready to erase the stain of Dunkirk, to lift the shrouds of Nazi tyranny, to crush the axis in the growth of the United Nations. Airplanes growled overhead. Ships were gathering and steaming off into the channel, and final road convoys rumbled into the embarkation areas. We all sprawled around the general's private field office and were given the picture. In a tiny tent, some 15 feet square, we sat and listened to the most amazing delivery of dynamic facts I have ever heard. We overcrowded and spilled half out of the tent onto its backyard concrete terrace. It is a modest office. The inner wall of the tent is half lined from the ground up with slats from packing cases. And some ingenious sergeant has stained those slats into imitation pine paneling. The floor is concrete with a couple of rope rugs. There's one desk, a telephone, two chairs, and a moderate wall map. Otherwise, the tent show is the tree-shaded terrace and three pieces of deck chair furniture. You have to tear your eyes from the general to note these things because he holds your interest completely. When you appreciate his tremendous command of facts and figures, duplicated, I think, only by General Marshall, you understand why he was picked for this assignment. It is not opportune to release the details of our briefing on behalf of the general except in three general ways. One, he wanted all the credit for this campaign to go to the common soldiers of the Allied Army, and he emphasized the lower ranks and the word Allied. His order of the day takes that vein. Two, he had nothing but praise for the untiring efforts and inexhaustible research of his various staffs and his various commanders for air, sea, armies, and supplies. Three, as to the actual plan itself, Perhaps I can best put it this way. I have been in on all of General Eisenhower's amphibious assaults, but none was as involved or as mammoth as this one. Last-minute headaches? Yes, the general had a last-minute headache, and he expressed it beautifully when he suddenly jumped from his chair and said, Good heavens, there's some sunshine. Otherwise, the invasion of Europe had already been pat for days. We came out of the tent and strolled toward his proudest, newest possession. Just the general and myself. He praised his new mobile office, a super deluxe job built into a 10-ton truck and trailer and presented to him by the Lockheed workers here. And then I asked him about his own nerves. He stopped hatless in the sun. He is supposed to be phlegmatic. But he said quietly, I'm so gall darn nervous I boil over. He's not supposed to show it. He didn't either. I caught him only twice, wringing his hands or jiggling his English change. But I like reporting that he is human enough to feel what the lowliest of his troops feel. We went to a parachute of space just before their takeoff for France. For this invasion, the general honors his vast airborne forces that are now employed in battle. We went from airfield to airfield, talking to the airborne troops and to the Air Force crews that flew them to their targets. The general's car would roll up, and always the procedure was the same. The men would snap to attention, sneaking a final chew on their gum as they did so. Their faces were smeared with cocoa and linseed oil. It gave a Halloween twist to their grin. When the general ordered them to stand easy, he would move among them. Where are you from, General Ike would ask one boy. What did you do in civilian life? How old are you? Are you a good shot with that rifle? What do you weigh? Who's the toughest man in the battalion? And so it went down the line. And invariably, off in another corner of the field, the men would start shouting for Ike. Yes, just Ike. And over he'd go, repeating the questions all over again verbally sparring with them, giving them the impression that this general was just one of the guys who thought they were the best soldiers in the world. One boy said he was an expert rifleman. Good, said the general. That's what we'll win for you tonight. From one quick-witted youngster, the general was told that the toughest man in the battalion would be selected after they jumped in France. Good, said the general. Send him back to me and I'll have something for him. But the visit was brief. The yell went down the line to load plane one and the men started trooping off. General Ike yelled good luck and saluted them time after time. This outfit had been assigned the toughest mission of all. They knew it, and the general knew it. And both are part of a winning team. Soon, hundreds of planes were circling overhead in the gathering gloom, their warm yellow lights making them look like pure 
horizontal Christmas trees rushing into the night. They took formation and disappeared toward the channel, extinguishing their lights to make their approach as the first wave to strike on the second front. His face raised to their thundering black shapes, General Eisenhower watched the planes disappear toward France. Nothing to do now but sweat it out back at the camp. Try to read a cheap murder mystery or a wild westerner. Refrain from calling any of the commanders for news. Just hang on and wait. A stroll down the path with slippers and robe and another cigarette. A pause to hear the faint passage of a fleet of bombers. A game of checkers or Jim Rummy with Commander Butcher. Will the night never end? Phlegmatic? But when his men have left him behind, he's with them always, just the same. The battle has been joined until his men appeal to him for his renewed assistance as the campaign takes more definite shape from its fluid beachhead, the general will take his chance and wait. That was how it started. Then our troops launched the great assault. That assault, too, was officially announced in an historic broadcast at 3.32 o'clock this morning, Eastern Wartime. Communique number one from the Supreme Allied Headquarters. Here is the recording of that dramatic message. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. The communique will be repeated. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. This ends the reading of communique number one from Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force. NBC has just brought you on transcription two historic broadcasts, reports by which the nation first heard of the Allied invasion of the continent in the early hours of this morning. This is the NBC Newsroom in New York. We now continue with a program of music. And now we bring you Tommy Taylor and Taylor Made Songs with Irving Miller and his orchestra. This program of music will be interrupted immediately on receiving news of the invasion front. <laughs> Goodbye to all we've ever had Alone where we have walked together Love and 
Tommy Taylor, music by Irving Miller and his orchestra, coming to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. One thirty Eastern Wartime, your station, WEAF, New York. Continuing its up-to-the-minute coverage of the Allied invasion of northern France, 
The National Broadcasting Company now presents Don Hollenbeck. Mr. Hollenbeck is heard regularly from the New York studios of NBC and has seen lengthy foreign service. He was formerly heard from Italy, where he covered that campaign, notably the Allied landing at Salerno. Mr. Hollenbeck. First, a reminder to listen to the broadcast from NBC of King George, 3 p.m. Eastern Wartime over your NBC station. Guinea pigs used for experimental purposes seldom live to talk about the experiment. As one of the guinea pigs for this invasion of Europe today, I'm lucky enough to be alive to give a guinea pig's reaction to the real thing. Africa, Sicily, and Italy were the laboratories. At Salerno, we got the final tests. The lessons learned by the Fifth Army at Salerno are in a large part responsible for these initial successes today. The battles aren't won yet by any means, but some of the failures and shortcomings at Salerno are being turned to good account as the Allies pour into Western Europe. Lesson number one, you've got to have air power, plenty of air power to cover the landing operations. We didn't have it, and at that time it was simply impossible to get it. Our fighter planes had to make round trips from Sicily. We had no landing strips any closer than that, and there weren't any carrier-based craft to cover us up. The long round trips meant the air forces had very little time to spend protecting us. Half an hour, 45 minutes at the most. Consequently, for a good part of the time, the only planes over us were JU-88s, ME-109s, FW-190s. We were never sure from one moment to the next that our narrow hole in the Salerno Beach wouldn't be blasted loose by the dive bombers. How different today. Under that tremendous umbrella of 11,000 aircraft of all types, the Allies have absolute mastery of the air over the invasion beaches. And I know how much better the earthbound soldiers in Normandy must be feeling this afternoon because they know that air umbrella is over their heads. No chance of it leaking to let death and destruction through. Lesson number two, sea power. We rolled up the Mediterranean from various points in Africa and Sicily under escort, of course, but the escort was the barest minimum. No more than could absolutely be spared to protect the invading force. The navies had other jobs to do, other points at which to stand guard. As we hit the beach, there were a few destroyers, a few cruisers at our backs, the Dido and Mauritius, I remember, blasting away behind us at the German shore positions. It was several days before the really big stuff could get up. Those were the bad days when the German armored divisions were smashing down the Seely River, and it looked as if our visit to Italy might be a short and a bitter one. Finally they came, our own Pennsylvania, the British war spite and valiant, stood at our backs and sent tons of metal screaming over our heads and into the well-concealed German gun positions that were themselves battering a path for the German armored divisions and striking out to sea to hold up our landing of the reinforcements and supplies that were so badly needed. Looking back, it seems to me to be a draw whether it was air cover we finally got or the sea power that finally pulled up to back us up and take care of the German positions. It was impossible for the land forces to get at impossible for our little force of bombers to locate in those wild hills that end so abruptly in the Gulf of Salerno with only a little beach between them and the sea. Again, how different today, the mightiest sea force ever assembled, 4,000 ships to stand offshore and cover the landing forces. Undoubtedly, some of those ships that backed us up at Salerno and in Africa and Sicily are standing off the coast of Normandy today. As one of the guinea pigs who came back, I can speak with feeling about what a difference this makes to men who must do the grubby, dirty, bloody job of war. The infantrymen, the airborne troops, the paratroopers who must come to close grips with a savage enemy. You get as near a feeling of confidence as you can get when you know that there's air power to keep off the enemy planes. Sea power to silence the big guns lying hidden in front of you. We used to grumble at the sound of our 16-inchers, our own 3.7 slugging at the Germans. It was the kind of comfortable grumbling you do when you're comparatively safe. Men in panic, men in momentary fear of their lives have no time to grumble. There's probably some of that same kind of grousing going on in Normandy at this very moment. Veterans of other campaigns can get a little long-winded comparing and second-guessing. At the risk of that, I believe the men of the Fifth Army in that little arc of the beaches of Salerno contributed a great deal to these landings today. Those who didn't come back from the beaches of Salerno, those who came back maimed but alive... To them is owing a great debt that every one of us, every soldier going into France today, every airman and every sailor must not forget. Thank you, Don Hollenbeck. This is the NBC Newsroom in New York, ladies and gentlemen. And in just ten seconds, we're going to take you to London for a special broadcast. Stand by, if you will, and then again, we'll hear from Don Hol Hollenbeck. Go ahead, London.
Just one moment, please. We're trying to establish contact with London. Go ahead, London. NBC Newsroom in New York. We're sorry that we can't establish contact there with London at this time. Just as soon as we're able to overcome the technical difficulties, we'll take you there. But in the meantime, here is Don Hollenbeck once again. And here's some more detail on Prime Minister Churchill's second statement of the day. The Prime Minister said tonight Allied troops had penetrated in some cases several miles inland after, an, after effective landings on the French coast on a broad front. The Prime Minister said he had visited the various centers where the latest information was received and could state that this operation is proceeding in a thoroughly satisfactory manner. Many dangers and difficulties which appeared at this time last night extremely formidable are behind us, the war leader reported. Passage of the sea has been made with far less loss than we apprehended, Mr. Churchill said. The resistance of batteries has been greatly weakened by bombing by the Air Force, and the superior bombardment of our ships quickly reduced their power to dimensions which did not affect the problem. And here's still more on Churchill's statement. The Prime Minister announces that Allied airborne troops had captured several strategic bridges in France before they could be blown up. And there is even fighting proceeding in the town of Cannes. Churchill addressing the House of Commons after a visit to General Dwight D. Eisenhower's headquarters in company with King George described the landing of airborne troops on the European continent as an outstanding feat on a scale far larger than anything there has been seen so far in the world. And another reminder now, listen to King George at 3 p.m. over your NBC station, 3 p.m. King George. Continuing with the Prime Minister, these landings took place with extremely little loss and great accuracy. Earlier, the Prime Minister told the cheering House that the Allied liberating assault was proceeding according to plan, and what a plan. Just a year ago today, I was broadcasting from London for NBC. This story led the broadcast, and I quote, When the great day of invasion comes, and it can't be far away, the British Navy is ready. Never before has the Navy been in a stronger position. The spirit of the crews has never been higher. They know that now they will go into action with an air umbrella sufficiently powerful to offset the efforts of the diamond torpedo bombers that have been their greatest worry since the war began. Britain has built a thousand warships since 1939. Units of this great fleet are already at battle stations, ready for the signal. Well, that was one year ago today. That broadcast might have been given moments before this great news came today. And if it was the situation one year ago, it isn't difficult to know with what spirit the men of the Allies went into France today. One year has seen the growth of those navies and air forces to proportions probably not dreamed of then. If ever we were ready to strike, we were ready today. At Salerno, sometimes we wondered if it wasn't too little and too soon. We held on by the skin of our teeth, but we held on. Today the word must be enough and at the right moment. And here's a late bulletin. President Roosevelt's top military, naval, and air chieftains reported to him today that the massive Allied cross-channel assault is doing well up to now. The invasion is doing all right so far, Admiral Ernest J. King, Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, said as he left the White House after an hour and a half's conference with the Chief Executive. And another late report, Suprema Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces, says more than 10,000 tons of explosives were showered on invasion coastal targets by an estimated 31,000 airmen in the eight-hour period between midnight yesterday and 8 a.m. today. Now, once again, we'll try to establish contact with London. NBC News, Roman, New York, we take you now to London. The time has come to deal the enemy a terrific blow in Western Europe. The blow will be struck by the combined sea, land, and air forces of the Allies, together constituting one great Allied team under the supreme command of General Eisenhower. On the eve of this great adventure, I send my best wishes to every soldier in the Allied team. To us is given the honor of striking a blow for freedom which will live in history. And in the better days that lie ahead, men will speak with pride of our doings. We have a great and a righteous cause. Let us pray that the Lord, mighty in battle, will go forth with our armies, and that his special providence will aid us in the struggle. I want every soldier to know that I have complete confidence 
in the successful outcome of the operations that we are now about to begin. With stout hearts and with enthusiasm for the contest, let us go forward to victory. And as we enter the battle, let us recall the words of a famous soldier spoken many years ago. These are the words he said. He either fears his fate too much, or his deserts are small, who dare not put it to the touch, to win or lose it all. Good luck to each one of you, and good hunting on the mainland of Europe. This is the NBC Newsroom here in New York, and here is Don Hollenbach with further comment. First a bulletin from Folkestone. German guns across the English Channel opened fire at 5 p.m. today for the second time since the invasion began, but ceased as soon as Royal Air Force planes appeared over them. You remember Joan Ellis, the 22-year-old British teletype operator who sent that false flash three days ago reporting the European invasion. Well, Joan is happily remembered by newspaper editors now that D-Day has finally arrived. Newsmen found time to message expressions of agreement with James P. Roseman, managing editor of the Akron, Ohio Beacon Journal, who said, based on Joan Ellis' statement, asking America to forgive me, suggest AP editors cable message to her. Ours would be, no one in Ohio concerned about invasion flesh. Good luck and carry on. And incidentally, that voice you just heard from London was General Montgomery... Good word and good cheer to his troops. More about Joan Ellis. Tell the British girl who flashed the invasion Saturday that we all love her and that she scooped the world. The South Bend, Indiana Tribune message. Please cable Joan Ellis that Indiana thinks you knew it all the time. And now a moment for a look at other war theaters. There the news is not so good as it is from Europe. The Fourth Battle of Changsha opened yesterday as Japanese troops advancing along several routes reached the outer defenses of the Ki Hunan province stronghold the Chinese High Command announces tonight. Three times in the past six years, the Chinese have hurled back the invaders from the gates of the city, barring enemy control of the Hankow-Canton Railroad, but the latest Japanese offensive appears the most determined of all. One Japanese column reached Changsha's outskirts after pushing down the roadbed of the Hankow-Canton Railway from captured Kwai Yi, while another enemy spearhead advanced from Ping Kiang, 50 miles northwest of Changsha. On the left bank of the central China front, the invaders broke into Yuan Qiang on the south shore of Lake Tung Ting, 50 miles northwest of Changsha, the communique says, and were attacking Yi Yang, Su River Town, 48 miles northwest of the Hunan capital. And according to the OWI, a late bulletin, Radio France in Algiers has broadcast a statement by André Le Troquet, French commissioner for the administration of liberated territories in metropolitan France. He declares, the liberation of France has started. And one more reminder, 3 p.m. Eastern Wartime, King George over your NBC station. Don't fail to hear King George 3 p.m. over your NBC station. And now a brief roundup. Allied invasion armies landed in northwestern France today, drove at least nine and a half miles into the German West Wall to the town of Cannes. After 12 hours of fighting, they held beachheads on a broad front along the coast of Normandy. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard a news report by Don Hollenbeck of the National Broadcasting Company's news staff. We suggest that you stay dialed to NBC for the latest details and for each development of this invasion operation. We are making every effort to bring you this story just as it unfolds, or rather as it is unfolded to us here in the NBC newsroom in New York, the crossroads of the news. This is the National Broadcasting Company. WEAF, New York. The National Broadcasting Company continues its invasion coverage from Washington as we bring you now Morgan Beatty from the NBC Newsroom in Washington. Mr. Beatty. General Eisenhower's Supreme Allied Headquarters in London tonight reflects the air of optimism that pervades the regular news reports. 
A headquarters spokesman said this at about 7 p.m. London time. Opposition in all quarters was less than expected. Allied naval losses were very, very small. Casualties in the first attacks were less than expected. Coastal gunfire was sporadic. Only 50 German planes were sighted over the invasion coast area in the first eight hours of assault. Allied planes, for their part, dumped 10,000 tons of bombs out of 7,500 planes, and still the air armadas take off from Britain. There's divided opinion as to why the Germans failed to meet the first wave of Allied forces, the wave that pierced the invasion coast, up to 12 miles on the original thrust. Prime Minister Winston Churchill himself made a careful inspection of all reports tonight, and in London he said... You remember he says that the Allies did not achieve tactical surprise, or rather did achieve tactical surprise. This, however, does not mean strategic surprise. There's a difference. For those of us who don't know our military terms, there's a difference between tactical and strategic surprise. What the Prime Minister was saying was this. The Germans knew, because of its nature, our general plan to assault the coasts of Europe. They did not know the time and the place, so they were surprised in a given area but not in a general way. That's the difference between tactical and strategic surprise in military assault. The Germans, we can now report, had no opportunity to guess the timing of invasion because General Dwight Eisenhower was the man who set that time. He had it set for Monday, yesterday, and because of bad weather, he changed his mind and put the great assault off for 24 hours. A few minutes ago, here in Washington, Admiral Ernest King of the Navy and General George Marshall and General Henry H. Arnold visited the White House Uh, General Arnold, of course, is with the Air Forces. They discussed war reports with the President. They had nothing to say about their conference with the chief executive when they came out. Only one of the three had anything to say about the invasion itself. Quite fittingly, it was Admiral King of the Navy, the service that helped the Royal Navy put the invasion troops ashore in France. Admiral King shares the cautious optimism of Mr. Churchill. Invasion, he told reporters, is doing all right so far. The others smiled as if in complete agreement. It seems, therefore, at the moment... That cautious optimism is warranted. The Germans did not have the coastal defense system at the point of attack that they should have had, and for reasons that do not appear in the news report at this time. But optimism must be tempered with the realization that the enemy has not yet committed his skilled air force, what's left of it, nor his veteran reserves in Western Europe. He's counting on those reserves for counterattacks. But let's go to the Pentagon building across the river from Washington for a military interview that will cover this and other points. Go ahead. NBC Pentagon. Here in our NBC broadcasting booth in the Pentagon building are two American Army officers who've recently returned from the European Theater of Operations. Both were on hand to witness the final preparatory stages for D-Day. They are Colonel Robert O. Montgomery of the Field Artillery, whose present assignment is at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and Lieutenant Colonel John R. Ulmer of the Infantry, who is stationed in Washington as assistant editor of the Infantry Journal. Both Colonel Montgomery and Colonel Ulmer went to England as observers for the Army ground forces. Uh, Colonel Montgomery, I believe the people at home would very much like to know the extent of the training of our troops for this invasion. You saw many of these troops in England. Can you tell us something about them? The troops of the Army ground forces in England were either veterans of combat in other theaters or troops that had undergone complete basic unit training in the United States. The troops who had seen combat in other theaters showed extreme confidence in their ability to carry out their mission. They were all anxious to get it over with, to go into combat as soon as possible. Their physical condition was excellent, their morale of the highest. Now, what about the troops that hadn't seen combat, Colonel? The men fresh from the States. The troops who hadn't been in combat also had a high order of morale, and their physical condition appeared to be excellent, too. They appeared to be well-trained, insofar as men could be well-trained without actually engaging in battle. I saw at no time any evidence of lack of confidence in their own individual ability or in their leader. Colonel Montgomery, how much training do these men have that approximated the conditions they are now facing as they land on the European continent? All the tactical divisions went through the excellent course of training at the United States Army Assault Training Center in England. There they practiced making landings on hostile beaches. The beaches were mined with reduced charges of landmines. They also learned how to move forward to capture objectives several miles from the beach. They worked with full-scale models of concrete seawalls, exact duplicates of the German Atlantic coast defenses which they're up against now. Uh, Colonel Elmer, it's about time we heard from you. 
What about the weapons used by our assault forces? Uh, many types of weapons were probably used. Infantry mortars, chemical mortars, fieldatory fire, probably from landing craft, flamethrowers. And, and in the initial stages, naval gunfire is effective against concrete fortifications. Colonel Montgomery, do you have anything to add on that score? Well, concrete emplacements may be attacked in various ways. By rocket fire from launchers mounted on medium tanks, by point-blank artillery fire from 155-millimeter guns and those of higher caliber, and by engineering methods, by pushing explosives up against the wall, by tanks, or placing them there by hand. And, of course, by bombing operations from the air. Planes can hurt concrete fortifications if they hit them at a crucial point, but I think aviation will be used to harass enemy supply lines and to strafe enemy troops. Well, what about the possibility of an early German counterattack? Colonel Montgomery? We can expect local German counterattacks at any time, but a concentrated, coordinated German counterattack will probably not take place until the German high command feels sure they know where the principal Allied effort is being made. Colonel Ulmer, how about a word for your special field of interest, the infantry, the humble doughboy? Thousands of tons of equipment and gear were shipped to England. Hundreds of specialists had to do many small tasks. But their only purpose was and is to get the man with the rifle forward, the infantryman. He's the guy who's going to win this operation. From General Eisenhower on down, the idea is to get the man with the rifle forward. He may travel by air or on a boat, but when he wins this thing, he'll do it on his own two feet. Well, there's more to an infantryman than these days than just a man with a rifle. Isn't that right, Colonel Almer? Yes. Today's uh, infantryman fights not only with a rifle and bayonet, but with mortars, cannon carbines, automatic rifles, light and heavy machine guns, and grenades. An infantry regiment has at least 15 different weapons, but all of them are only to get that doughboy with the rifle in his hand forward. And how about a last word from you, Colonel Montgomery? I believe, and I know Colonel Lomar agrees, that the American Army taking part in the invasion today is the best equipped and best trained American Army that has ever entered the initial stages of combat. Thank you, Colonel Robert Montgomery and Lieutenant Colonel John Ulmer. Now back to Morgan Beatty. Thank you, Holly Wright, Colonel Montgomery, and Colonel Ulmer. There are two points there that I think will bear repeating. The point of the fact that this army that's attacking the coast of Europe today is the most experienced army of its kind in history. That sounds strange, coming as it does from a nation that has not been at war and has not planned for war for many years. But you must remember that this is amphibious attack in a modern way. And we are more experienced in amphibious attack in all parts of the world, the British and ourselves, than any other armed forces. And then that other point about the infantrymen. The other day, Admiral Cochrane came to this studio and with me pointed out the very important thing, that infantrymen must take real estate before anything can happen in the way of victory in warfare. A couple of hours ago, I sat in the Senate with a group of our lawmakers discussing invasion. Some of them went on the air to express their feelings to you and what they were thinking. I've never seen the lawmakers of the nation in quite the mood they expressed today. Senator Alvin Barkley sat silent in his chair. The majority leader, the leather-lunged orator, was not in an oratorical mood. But he came to the microphone and said just about what any boy's father would say. And then his mind went back to the hymns of childhood in old Kentucky. Like all of the rest of us, Senator Barkley seemed to sense that this is a supreme moment in history. The men and women who must carry us through now are at their battle stations. They've already begun to take part in the greatest military effort of all time. The combined effort more nations than you can count on your fingers and toes are making. All of us share hopes and fears for these brave men. But there are people in the background, millions of them, who've done more than just hope and more than fear. They represent the spirit of people generally in the Allied world, civilians in the rear rank, you might say. There are people like Mary Galasso, whom I met in England more than a year ago, a second-generation British girl of Italian descent, a girl from Liverpool. And in a short year's time, Mary Galasso won her way from complete obscurity to a place on the envied 1,000 crew of girls who aimed the deep-throated anti-aircraft guns in the darkness at Hitler's blitzing planes over England. Mary was a poor toy factory girl who wanted to do something big for Britain. So she got a job in the ATS, the Women's Auxiliary Army, the British version of the WAX over here, 
And Mary mastered the radar control system. And when I saw her in Britain, she was the champion calculator of her gun emplacement in the London zone. Mary's 33, unmarried, and she wants to make a career out of Britain's guns. And she's tending one of those guns today on Invasion Day. Another great woman in Britain is Grandma Pegg. Mrs. Mary Pegg is her real name, who's turning out airplanes or helping to in her 79th year. I get up, she says, at 6 o'clock and come home at 7 in the evening, but it's worth it to smash Hitler. And I almost left out the telephone operator in London who lost both arms in the original Blitz. She's 18, and after she had lost her arms, she had the burning ambition to return to work. So officials of the Ministry of Pensions sent a limb manufacturing mechanic around to her hospital, and he spent months on the job. There's a special gadget now on her right arm, a sort of extension, and a billiard cue rest for the other arm. Mechanical bits and pieces, as they say in Britain, enable this girl to dial phones and plug in cords. And she's on the job today for invasion, freeing another worker for more vital war work. Here in America, the pressure for woman power to fill out the gaps, piece out the manpower, is not so great. Even so, Fritz Reiner of the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra has taken on 18 women. Two of these women played the stringed bass, usually reserved for men. Few of us realize how important it is to carry on with the regular affairs of everyday life in wartime, especially in these critical hours, so long as we do not impair the tempo of the battle. These 18 women in Pittsburgh are doing their part. Then there's George Wolkham, a junior of Chicago, and his neighborhood gang. They set out a few weeks ago to collect waste paper to help win the war. George's three little sisters, between six and ten, were the advance agents, they scouted out new sources of supply through the neighborhood. George and his brother, uh, George Cortelet, they're 12 and 13, were the heavy men with the wagon, the Wolkomer's little wed wa- red wagon. And in four days, working after school and evenings, these children collected 4,622 pounds of waste paper. Mrs. Wolkomer was surprised and curious about all this sudden industry. What inspired the campaign, and when would it end, she asked. And sure enough, there was a plan. George and his gang wanted money. Yes, money for model plane kits, George's favorite hobby. But the kits were going to wounded soldiers in a hospital in the nearby neighborhood. And then there's the tragic side of civilian work in war. In Silver Spring, Maryland, near Washington the other day, a funeral procession rolled slowly away from the mortuary. It was just like any other funeral, you'd think. They were burying Mrs. Lorraine B. Chandler, a 21-year-old Navy bride, of eight months. Nobody would have known that Mrs. Chandler was a war hero. Nobody fired any salutes. Nobody played taps. But she was a war hero. For Lorraine Chandler died in the Bureau of Standards in Washington. She was blown through a second-story window in an explosion. The details cannot be told until after this war has passed us by. All they'll say over at the Bureau of Standards is that Lorraine was working with four other scientists, most of them youngsters like herself, on an urgent war project to make our aviation gasoline better, the very gasoline that is propelling the planes on invasion day. And, we're told, they did make aviation gasoline better. But Lorraine Chandler might as well have died on the battlefield or in an airplane like the Colin Kellys and all the others who won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Because, after all, it takes 120 civilians to make a war as well as 10 million brave fighting men. And some of these civilians, a few, give their lives too. That's all for now, and thank you. I'll be back tomorrow at this same time. You've heard Morgan Beatty from the NBC Newsroom in Washington and his analysis of the invasion news. We also heard from Colonel Robert Montgomery and Colonel Ulmer speaking from the huge Army Pentagon building across the Potomac River from the nation's capital. Morgan Beatty is heard over most of these same stations every weekday, Monday through Friday, from the NBC Newsroom in Washington. Tomorrow, at this same time, keep up with the news with Morgan Beatty. This is the National Broadcasting Company. It's 2 o'clock Eastern War Time. This is WEAF, New York. Next in its complete coverage of Invasion News, NBC presents war reporter and news analyst Elmer Peterson. Mr. Peterson was in Warsaw, Poland, when the Germans invaded that country. He then moved on to Scandinavia. It was there when the Nazis stormed into North Europe. 
He will give you a military and political picture of events leading up to today's great thrust. Mr. Peterson. Hour by hour, the story of the invasion is being filled in. We're getting a better idea of what's involved, not only in equipment and preparation, but in what we are expending in human effort and courage. But these are hours also when we have reason to reflect with pride on what we have achieved to gain the present moment. For this is a moment of great and effective contrast if we consider how far we've traveled since the start of the war in Europe. Now we're using some 11,000 planes in this invasion. We're using 4,000 ships. We are using all sorts of new and modern equipment. But we can think back to that September day in 1939 when the Germans struck at Poland. The Germans had things their own way then. They moved with precision and deliberation. Their bombers swept over Warsaw against little or no resistance. I was in Warsaw at that time. I watched the citizens of Warsaw parading with enthusiasm through the streets when they learned that Britain and France had declared war on Germany. Now, shouted the Poles, the Germans will pay their price. But a week later, the Polish government was fleeing from Warsaw. Berlin had not been bombed. The Germans had not been punished. Britain and France were unprepared. There was nothing they could really do. They had relied on sea power, on blockade, on that pompous and outworn defense idea known as the Maginot Line. And again in April 1940, I watched the Germans strike with the advantage of thorough preparation, this time into Denmark in Norway. Today, the expeditionary force sent by the British and French to Norway at that time seems like something out of the days of ancient warfare. What a contrast in preparation, in efficiency, between the fighting in Norway in the spring of 1940 and what we are seeing now in France. Those British territorials who went to Norway were badly equipped, badly clothed. They had no air support. They had no modern weapons by present standards. They provided evidence, shocking evidence, of how the democracies had failed to appreciate what the Germans had created in the way of an army. The Germans had the advantage in surprise attack, in methodical preparation, just as we now have that advantage. What they profited by in Poland, in Norway, were their years of patient study, their scheming, and their developed use of fifth columnists. Think, too, of how easily the Germans took Denmark how by merely demonstrating their power, they forced the Danes to yield with hardly a shot being fired. I remember talking to Copenhagen on the first day of the German invasion of that country with a German officer I had known in Berlin. We'll win, don't you think, he said to me. No, I said, out of some stubborn conviction, you won't win in the end. You can't win. He looked at me with surprise. But you see what we have, he replied. You were in Poland. You've worked in Germany. What can the British and French put up against us? I had to agree that he had some justification for his own confidence. For it was difficult to watch the manner in which the Germans went into Scandinavia without wondering how the democracies would retrieve their position. Even though the lesson is learned, one thought, how can we catch up with all this enormous German concentration of striking power, their well-laid strategy? And the events that followed, the advance of the Germans through the Low Countries, those tragic days of Dunkirk, those fateful days in North Africa before the tide of battle turned, all these things gave good cause to wonder. Yes, it's when we think of these things that we realize the enormity of allied achievement in war production, in winning the Battle of the Atlantic, in patiently devising a strategy of victory, that strategy which now sees our soldiers, our planes, our ships beating hard against the continent of Europe. Every few minutes now, there's a new report which shows how magnificently this present invasion has been planned, how much attention there has been to the smallest detail. Yes, the Germans have had their day of outmaneuvering, outsmarting the Allies. Now the tables have been turned. The American soldiers who have gone ashore in France, those 30,000 American paratroopers now fighting somewhere behind the German lines, are equipped with the best weapons that can be devised. In fact, the British Ministry of Supply has just announced that many secret weapons were used for the first time by the Allies in their invasion of Western France today. Moreover, these soldiers of ours are fighting under efficient leadership. They play their part in plans that have been worked out over a period of years. What a contrast that presents to those soldiers who four years ago tried to beat back the Germans in Norway. What great forward strides we have made since those days when the people of Poland fled before the German attack. What we are seeing now is a vindication of what was once considered unwarranted delay in opening the second front. For we have, after all, had to wait until we could strike with full effect, until we could build up from those days when, 
Out of failure to appreciate German intentions, we were not fully prepared. In other, among other things, we are striking now with full and complete information. Our intelligence service, which failed so badly during those early days of the war, now is functioning efficiently. And the Germans already are claiming that they've arrested and captured many so-called, what they consider enemy agents, during the invasion so far. And there are remarkable contrasts to consider also as regards the people of Europe. In fact, this is a day to consider the confidence that once prevailed in Germany during those days when the German radio reported nothing but victory, when the German people were flushed with their thoughts of mastering Europe completely, and Russia as well, to say nothing of their hopes of dominating the world. Goering, you'll recall, once boasted that no planes would ever reach Berlin. Today, the Germans face an estimated 11,000 planes available to support the invasion alone. And we have yet to see the full evidence of what our air power will do now to further a victorious advance toward Berlin. We don't, of course, as yet know how freely the Nazis have revealed to the German people the full details of the present invasion. We do know that the news is bound to affect the German people. I find myself thinking now of a day in Berlin in 1940. In a German motion picture theater, I watched a newsreel showing the Nazi version of their triumph at Dunkirk. Strangely enough, there was only a smattering of applause, and the reason was apparent. Many of the Germans in that theater had memories of the last war, and in the back of their minds, there was even then the disturbing thought that the last war might repeat itself. In fact, I heard one German say, yes, it's all very fine, but we've had mar we had marvelous victories up to the last day of the first war also. So we can only reflect on what will be the effect on such thinking of today's news that Allied armies are back on the continent at a time when Rome has been captured in a, new, in a great symbolic victory, at a time when the German armies have been driven out of Russia with the Red Armies poised for new offensives. In fact, the Allied invasion of France has touched off considerable speculation concerning Russia. In London, military observers, according to a report just in, say that probably within 24 to 48 hours, and almost certainly before the end of this week, Soviet armies will swing their vast power into a synchronized offensive with the Anglo-American Western Front. The German radio itself indicates that they have a, Germans have a strong fear of this. In any event, the, the fact that we appreciate the importance of the invasion on the German mind is evident in the reports of how thoroughly our own propaganda organization is now at work, how we are making every effort to take the most advantage of the great attack now underway in the field of psychological warfare, in the field of nerve warfare against the enemy. What we need now is to actually see Allied troops on German soil, to offer another convincing proof to the German people that they cannot in the end win, that they can only hope to avoid some destruction of war by surrendering. And we must consider, too, that the Germans from now on are going to pay increasing attention to their hopes and plans of getting some advantage out of the surrender they must make in the end. The Germans, we can be sure, are going to fight on as long as they can, and they may be able to delay their surrender for many weeks, perhaps months to come. We mustn't make the mistake of assuming that merely because we've established some successful beachheads, victory is assured. These landings today are by no means synonymous with complete and thorough victory, although we have every reason to hope that our plans have been so well laid and that our attacking force is so great that we are bound to sweep on very quickly, perhaps, toward final victory. But we have had ample evidence that the Germans want, if possible, to fight still another war. They want, if possible, to surrender while millions of German soldiers are still not aware of defeat, while Germany is still intact in many respects, as an economic unit, and with German soil not turned into a battleground, rather with the countries around Germany torn and suffering by the impact of war. One thing is certain, the Germans will do a good and thorough job of destruction as they now retreat before the invasion forces. For the invasion now underway is not only intended to bring Allied troops into Berlin, it's also designed to destroy the German army to administer the same sort of beating that General Alexander is inflicting on the Reichswehr in Italy. It's all the more reason why we may, at any moment now, hear of new Allied offensives designed to trap and encircle and destroy German fighting men. 
There's been a belief that the German High Command will in the end try to use the very fact of surrender as a weapon against the Allies, to create as much confusion as possible, to save something of the German war machine. And from now on, this belief is going to come into further prominence. For we have set in motion by the invasion weapons which may bring deep and profound political complications in a decision as to when and how we are going to accept German surrender. From now on, it's going to be a question not only of obtaining German surrender, but of deciding also under what conditions, under what circumstances we want to accept that surrender, and from whom. There's another contrast to be considered now. As our troops have moved onto the continent, there have been appeals to the patriots of the occupied countries to help. We have just received, for example, the, the text of, of the uh, appeal made by General Charles de Gaulle to his people of France from London. General de Gaulle broadcast to his own people that the Allies were certain of victory over the Nazis in the now Second Battle of France. He exhorted the French to fight with all means at their disposal to destroy the Germans in this battle for liberation. All those who can take action, said de Gaulle, with the Allied armies or engage in demolition work, must not let themselves be made prisoners by the Germans, he said. And here de Gaulle emphasized something which is very obvious, namely that now as the invasion proceeds, we will see a greater flurry of mass arrest by the Germans as they seek to divert all possible adult citizens out of the war zone and keep the underground movement from giving assistance to the Allies. Certainly the story of what will now happen in these occupied countries is going to make a brilliant chapter in the final victory. We have yet to see how much the German armies will suffer now from sabotage, from wrecked railways and bridges, from direct attacks, for that matter, from the underground armies. For hope in these occupied countries now has become a vital and living thing. The people of these countries have suffered and endured. But they have come a long ways from those days when, in France, in Norway, in the Netherlands, there was a feeling of deep despair. As a correspondent who saw the first reaction in such countries as Poland and Denmark, I can appreciate what this day must mean to the people of Europe. People like the Danes once were bewildered and confused. People like the Norwegians, for all their courage, had their moments of wondering if the future held any promise whatsoever. I saw their tears, their anguish at the beginning. Now, backed by years of preparations, they are ready to do their share. I predict that the very extent of organized underground resistance now to be revealed, aided by Allied equipment, will be more than amazing. And finally, there are the German satellite nations, those people who once were confident that Hitler would win, who staked their future on that victory. Up until now, they've been sustained by their final hope that somehow the Germans might manage to block the invasion. But there has been the lesson of Rome, and now, a so far successful in landing in France, a landing which we have every reason to believe will continue successful. And so the next few days may see great political upheavals in those satellite countries, especially when the Red Armies add their power to that now being thrown against the Germans from the West. In any event, we are on the threshold of great and important political advantages as well as military advantage. And here is a new bulletin just in. The Berlin Radio, in a German-language broadcast monitored by NBC, states that new Allied landings have been made on the French coast in the area of Carentan, roughly opposite the Channel Island of Jersey. No details are given, but it is an indication that Allied strategy goes beyond the main landings we have already reported. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard... To Elmer Peterson, NBC war reporter and news analyst. We suggest that you stay dialed to NBC for the latest details and for each development of this invasion operation. We're bringing you this story just as it is unfolded here in the NBC newsroom in New York. We now present music from New York. Just one moment, please.
is the NBC Newsroom in New York. This has been a day of momentous news. And not the least of the spectacular reports we've broadcast here from the NBC Newsroom in New York was the eyewitness account of our Stanley Richardson, the first reporter to bring back a first-hand report from one of the naval ships which took part in the invasion. His report was first broadcast early this morning. Now, for the benefit of NBC's listeners, we bring you a transcription of this historic broadcast by Stanley Richardson. Not a recognizable enemy plane appeared overhead. At least no bombs were dropped at or on any of the ships in our area. No low-flying fighters came over to strafe us with machine gun fire. And no enemy vessel, not even one of their vaunted e-boats, came out to the attack. The officers and men with whom I rode wondered searchingly about this. They had been keyed up with some real German opposition, both from the air and the sea. Their trigger fingers were itching for a scrap, and they were a very disappointed lot at not getting it. If the Germans weren't just too timid to come out, the only other ready explanation that could be advanced was that they were too busily engaged in coping with the Allied air attacks made on their shore establishment as a prelude to the actual landing of troops. In the area we covered, we could see hundreds of bombers and fighters shuttling back and dropping their bomb loads and returning to England for more explosives to blast the enemy. We could see the big two-engined American transport planes, also in the hundreds, returning to their bases in the United Kingdom after dropping their airborne troops in France. Yes, Terry had a lot to keep him busy last night and early today, but as far as the naval phase of our activity was concerned, not a shot was exchanged with the enemy while I was on the scene. For that preliminary phase of the show, at any rate, it was all too incredibly easy. We left our patrol torpedo boat based in daylight to accompany the slower-moving light advance guard of ships, which had to pave the way for the actual landing. One of our missions was to protect the Allied minesweepers, which cleared a wide channel straight to the enemy shore where our two transports and supply ships. Long lines of ships of every description were discernible on the skyline. Literally miles of craft in even columns converging upon the area in the channel marked for the concentration point for the actual invasion. Huge transports, tank landing ships, smaller troop landing craft, tankers and supply vessels of every kind plotted doggedly along under lowering skies tapering over heavy seas. You people at home would have been thrilled to the bone to have seen all these American men, American ships, and American supplies sailing calmly into the action for which they had been prepared and trained for so many miles. It was estimated that there were more than 4,000 ships of all kinds in the channel for this combined operation. By nightfall, we were nearing the French coast, and our watch tightened. But nothing happened. Even when a full... The moon, appearing fitfully from behind the clouds, gave our position away clearly to any enemy who may have been lying in wait for us. Then the fast and heavy combat ships moved up into position. All aligned themselves in the bombardment area to loose a hail of high explosives to protect the troops moving into the beaches on their landing craft. The warships started laying their smoke screens preparatory to shooting their guns. It was within only a few minutes of each hour of the long-awaited D-Day. And right there was where I got the biggest disappointment of my life. We turned around and headed back at high speed for the English coast. Our PT squadron was under orders to return to base and refuel for another mission as soon as its first operation was completed. So I didn't even hear the bombardment begin. But I can tell you that if things are going as well now as they look to be going at the time I left the scene... It won't be long before our trip troops have a firm foothold. That was a direct report from London, a rebroadcast by transcription, of the first eyewitness account from a reporter who covered the invasion aboard an Allied invasion. The report of NBC's Stanley Richardson, Somewhere in England. And now NBC continues its special invasion coverage. And for more late news reports, here is NBC's Don Goddard.
Here's a bulletin just through. Transocean, in a Berlin broadcast, says the Allies have established a 15-mile front from a mile to a half a mile deep between Villers-sur-Mer and Trouville. This area is about seven miles south of the big port of Le Havre, where transatlantic liners docked in pre-war days, and it takes in the beach resort area of Deauville. And here's another bulletin. The British radio, just heard by NBC, by our monitors here, says that the Allied invasion line in France was sufficiently broad by evening to be more than a bridgehead. Then we have established more than a bridgehead on the northern coast of France. And a dispatch has just come through giving the location of one of our bridgeheads, or what is more than a bridgehead along the French coast now. Reporter Desmond Tigg stood on the deck of a British destroyer off the French village of bernier sur mer From that point, he watched the first wave of Allied troops storm on the beaches. bernier sur mer lies southeast of Le Havre. The reporter says the assault went on those smoking beaches and cordite smoke still curled skyward from a terrific bombardment by Allied warships. Wave after wave of khaki-clad figures stormed up the beach, overcame whatever opposition they found, won the immediate beachhead in a very short period of time, that beachhead that they have now expanded and are continuing to expand against German opposition. And soon after, the beachmasters had their organizations in order. Vehicles, guns, more troops, equipment of all descriptions were sorted out They were dispatched to their proper units. And shortly after that first wave of troops went ashore, one more division of Allied troops stormed in, bringing their equipment and battle supplies into Western Europe. And there on the beaches at Barrio sur mer the Allies have established one of their ever-widening beachheads. But I think the most encouraging note that's come from General Eisenhower's headquarters in London is that statement that Allied losses have been much lighter than expected came in earlier this afternoon. Fewer American, British, and Canadian lives lost. Fewer French lives lost fewer Belgian and and Dutch lives in the initial stages of invasion than was expected. It's not told officially just where along the French coast our troops have landed, just how many beachheads we have established. But the indications are that we have at least two large ones, and one Swedish report says we have at least a dozen smaller ones. Perhaps many more points have been invaded by Allied invasion forces by this time. The landings have occurred in a hundred-mile stretch of coastline between the cities of Le Havre and Cherbourg, as you know. General Eisenhower hit that portion of the French coast that is lowest, and that has the widest beaches. He avoided, or he thus far has avoided, the heavily fortified cliffs opposite Dover where the Germans have set up their heavy naval guns and miles upon miles of fortifications and defenses in depth. There are several versions of progress made by our invasion units to this hour. The official version from London states that Allied forces have thrust several miles inland. The Germans say that Allied spearheads have pushed to a point about 15 miles from the coast now. Later, they said the front had been widened. It is evident now that the great military thrust of Western Europe caught the Germans by surprise. That's been agreed upon now thoroughly. Only a day or so ago, radios in Berlin were saying the hour for invasion had come and had gone, that there would be no invasion in the near future. And I'm afraid that a great many people in this country thought the same thing. The reports coming back from London say that only very light enemy opposition, much lighter than expected, has been met so far. Great fleets of the RAF, and American planes laid a carpet of bombs over the invasion area. From midnight to 8 o'clock this morning, 7,500 sorties were flown from England. 7,500 sorties from 8 o'clock to now. And the invasion fleet of 4,000 vehicles, several thousand auxiliary craft, took uh, part in landing the troops, 4,000 vessels. Naval units, including heavy battleships, sailed in to within a mile of the shore, and they pounded away at German coastal positions so effectively that... Those guns, when they opened up in reply, showed that many of them had been hit. But London says our losses in invasion craft is very light. Either the uh, German aim was poor or their guns were knocked out before the main force of invasion craft came within firing range. And Berlin does admit that many thousands of paratroops and airborne soldiers spearheaded the great thrust in the hours of darkness last night, and they came on. The big Dakota transport planes flew over the channel with navigation lights showing so that they could keep formation. The airborne troops were dropped behind the German coastal defenses. There was very little loss among planes and personnel in the air prior to that landing. And the initial reports coming back from those isolated paratroopers say that they're holding their own. A German report says that Nazi tanks have been thrown into the fray to meet American tanks and British tanks. As yet, the vaulted Luftwaffe has not put in an appearance. Only about 50 German planes had been sighted over the entire invasion area up until 8 o'clock this morning. Fifty German planes against a total of some 7,500 Allied warplanes and more, 11,000 altogether flying there in the skies above that beachhead. But Allied airmen have warned that a violent reaction by American air forces is expected very soon. Reich Marshal Hermann Goering 
has issued an order of the day stating the invasion must be beaten off if the Luftwaffe has to perish. The grand assault was scheduled for yesterday, postponed for 24 hours because of bad weather. It was still heavy weather in the channel early this morning. Perhaps anxious moments in Allied headquarters until those uh, small craft had made the coast of France and disgorged their invasion cargo. Perhaps some of our soldiers became seasick in the crossing. Who knows? But the result of the fighting thus far do not show it. Prime Minister Churchill announced the invasion in the House of Commons six hours after the first seaborne troops had landed. He said the landings were the first of a series. He disclosed that 11,000 Allied planes were available for the fight. The Germans are said to have about one-fifth that number with which to combat the great offensive. Later on, Churchill made another speech to the House of Commons, reporting that things had gone better than our fondest hopes. And this is from your NBC newsroom in New York. This is Don Goddard speaking. NBC has cleared its schedule of all regular programs so that all day and all night you'll be able to hear the latest news of the invasion as it happens. It's 2.30 p.m. Eastern War Time. This is WEAF, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, it is NBC's privilege at this time to present the Most Reverend Francis J. Spellman, Archbishop of New York, who will read a prayer offered by him at the noon mass in St. Patrick's Cathedral today, Archbishop Spellman. God of wisdom, comfort, and strength, we come to thee with humble, contrite, and suppliant hearts. On the battlefields of the world, our America fights for faith and freedom. Like brilliantly burning lights, our ideals march with our armed forces. Our soldiers do not pray and fight for a selfish, cruel victory. They struggle, suffer, and die for a victory that is lasting peace. We suffer with them, and we pray that justice may give to them strength and courage. In our loneliness, sorrow, and pain, we beg thee, almighty God, to have mercy on those whom life and death have separated from their loved ones. We beg thee to help those who now have fear. We beg thee to have pity on all who suffer, on all who are weak, on all who are tempted to despair. Faith is the master of faith, is also the mother of freedom. And in this fateful hour, we plead with thee, O God, to be our solace, our strength, and our divine support. We pray that the lamp of our faith may light the road to victory and guide peoples of the world to freedom and peace. God bless America with faith to preserve her freedom. God bless her fighting men in this critical hour of our nation's life. God, strengthen our valiant wives, mothers, and fathers. God, guard our children and preserve to them the fruits of faith in freedom. Prayer for America. O oh God, Father of America, Thou hast formed this union of states sealing it with high destiny, that our nation be light to all peoples in their dark despair, life to all peoples in their fear of death, love to all peoples under their yoke of hate. For this destiny, 
Thou dost teach us to fly as the eagle, girding us with lightning and thunder, enriching us with treasures in fields and folds. O oh God, bless America with thy shielding graces, lest we become a nation without light, our eyes turned from thee. A nation without light, our souls sundered from thee. A nation without love, our hearts forgetting thee. O oh God, give us victory that is just, merciful, and wise. For thou hast chosen America to be the soul of thy justice, the medium of thy mercy, the instrument of thy wisdom. Let all nations know that our justice comes from thy spirit, our mercy from thy heart, our wisdom from thy mind, our victory from thy strength. Bless us, O Lord, with manifold graces to give freely of what we have, to give fully of what we are, and in victory to give ourselves alone to thee. O God, the Father of all nations, hear our prayer for our united peoples. Grant guidance to our leaders, protection to our sons, and teach all of us thy way of life in goodwill and peace. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard the Most Reverend Archbishop Francis J. Spellman of New York reading a prayer he offered today at the noon mass in St. Patrick's Cathedral and also his prayer for America.
gentlemen, has concluded the prayer as offered by Archbishop Spellman. We have here a bulletin from London. The German Transocean News Agency now says the Allied offensive area has been extended to the entire Norman Peninsula. And the British radio says that three hours after troops first hit the French coast, bulldozers were hard at work on the job of preparing a landing strip for our plane. The London staff of NBC's invasion reporters have been standing by since the first official flash was transmitted from General Eisenhower's headquarters at 3.32 this morning. Some of the men have been out with the assault unit, so we're now going to switch you to NBC in London for another broadcast from the focal point. While we are waiting for London to come in, I should like to comment for a moment on the development of this beach strip that the bulletin has just spoken of. The Normandy Peninsula has a large flat area which extends down to the coast. And evidently, our plans contemplated using that flat strip on the coast. In other words, we're doing something rather unusual. Instead of relying on airfields farther inland, we are now relying on an airfield that we are going to construct directly on the landing strip which we have taken on the Normandy shoreline. The fact that we brought in bulldozers, that they are now at work, indicates that. We take you now to London. This is London at 8.45 p.m. In a moment, we hope to establish contact with the American radio reporter, Merrill Muller, covering General Eisenhower's headquarters, somewhere in England. Go ahead, Merrill Muller. This is Robert Barr speaking from Advanced Allied Command Post on the 6th of June. This is the stat... This is London again. There has been a slight de delay in getting the broadcast up to now. One moment, please. By Duncan... It is evident then, from all recent dispatches, that we now have much more than a beachhead, because at one point our troops have extended their holdings to a width of more than 15 miles at one point, and we have that on the authority of the Germans themselves. Their latest estimate as to the size of our most important beachhead on the Normandy coast is 16 and a half miles in width, and the extension to a depth of several miles. That means, of course, that we can construct an airstrip right there on the beach, an airstrip that will be of great importance in the further development of our offensive operations. That would explain also the occupation of some of the Channel Islands, Guernsey and Jersey. Those islands are just off the coast of Normandy, and any effort to operate from Normandy would necessitate our eliminating the Germans who have been holding these Channel Islands. And so now, if you will look at your map, you'll see how this whole invasion picture ties up into a logical operation whose first objective is to secure complete control of the Normandy Peninsula.
That peninsula is 80 miles from Britain, and yet, for our purpose of invasion, it has many obvious advantages. And, of course, it had the particular advantage that the Germans were not expecting us to attack at that particular point. It's something like 120 miles from Paris. Once we hold it securely, and we can establish ourselves there more effectively in a short time, because it is a peninsula. That means that we have access to it from three sides, from the sea. The Germans have access to it only across a narrow strip of land. And so even with inferior forces, if we succeed in gaining time, we would be ready to meet the German assault which will undoubtedly develop against that peninsula. Obviously, what is happening now is that the Germans, having decided what our plan of campaign is on the basis of the events which they themselves have reported for us during the last 12 hours, obviously they are now concentrating their forces for the counterattack. We must expect that that will be a heavy attack. It is the first German major effort to answer the invasion. Their preliminary efforts, their preparations against invasion have largely failed. The passage of the sea across that 80 miles from the south British coast to Normandy was accomplished with much greater ease than we had expected. Our losses were far lower than we had anticipated. The bombings of our air forces and the superior bombardment developed by those tremendous naval guns ranging from 4 inch to 16 inch on a great host of warships which have been assailing the French coast now for the last 16 hours, that too was more effective than we had expected it to be. And as a result, when our invasion forces came in, they found that the defenses were much less effective than we had expected them to be. Obviously, this invasion effort which we are making is far larger than anything in history. These landings have taken place with extreme accuracy, as Mr. Churchill put it to the House of Commons. They have taken place with very little loss. Risk, of course, was involved. We did not want to take the greater risk that was involved in the bad weather which we had yesterday. And so the whole operation was postponed for 24 hours. And the obvious result, as is evidenced by what has happened today, was a decided reduction in the risk. Our airborne troops, therefore, are now well established. And we are following up. Because remember that only the first invasion waves have landed. We are now following up with other waves. We will continue to follow up with one wave after another. For obviously, this short distance of sea can be traversed in a very short time by all our craft, by our landing craft to go back for new loads, by our warships to get fresh supplies. And so, one wave of invasion will follow another. Now, it's also very possible that our plan contemplates at least two or three major invasions at as many different points. It is even possible that this Normandy invasion is a minor one compared with those that will follow. Remember what Mr. Churchill said some months ago when he said that there would be rehearsals and false landings. There would be attempts to deceive the enemy. We don't know which is going to be our major drive. And this is also possible, that we have two or three places in mind, any one of which could serve as a point of major attack. And we will permit developments to dictate whether or not this Normandy attack, or the one at the mouth of the Seine, at Havre, which is also being developed at this time, that that should be the one on which we base our major drive. Obviously, if we can get control of so fine a port as La Havre, which is undoubtedly the finest on that part of the French coast, we would be foolish not to use it to its full capacity. Yes, some of its installations will be destroyed, but we learned at Naples how quickly with our modern facilities, 
a harbor that seems completely unusable can be restored to use. And with all the experience that we have had in Africa and Italy to back us up, surely we are prepared to deal with whatever situation we may find in almost any French port. And so we are just coming now to the beginning of the invasion story. Let us remember that. This is only an initial move. It does not yet reveal the whole picture of our tactics. We are underway definitely in Normandy. We are underway definitely in the area of Arva. The fighting is going on heavily for the city of Caen, which is the most important railroad center of the Normandy Peninsula. It is already evident that our troops have penetrated from 10 to 15 miles, and it is quite possible that by this time junctions have been effected between those troops that debarked from the landing barges and those that were flown anywhere from 10 to 15 miles inland to cooperate in the invasion. The completeness of the surprise which we succeeded in effecting is evidenced by the fact that the Germans were unable to destroy a number of important bridges, bridges which had a key position in connection with the invasion. We had marked them on our maps. We had landed paratroopers with a specific function of controlling those bridges, and word has come back from the French continent that they were successful, that these bridges are in our control. And that means that all these tanks which have landed these tanks, some of which have already been in battle, are now going to be able to utilize those bridges in order to reach the key points connected with invasion. You have a picture of 250 miles of French coast, landings certainly at two important points, a beachhead expanded in one case to 16 and a half miles, landings possibly at anywhere from 7 to 9 the 12 other points, landings that are even now being developed. And within the next few hours, as the bulletins come in, you will see that the invasion operation, as we have reported it to you thus far, has only begun. We take you now to London for Merrill Muller. Somewhere in England. NBC uh, in New York calling London. Contact Merrill Muller at General Eisenhower's headquarters somewhere in England. So this terminates the broadcast in London. Stand by network, please. Once again, here's H.V. Kaltenborn. Well, I'm sorry that you didn't get Merrill Muller's broadcast, but such is Invasion Day with its peripatetic maneuvers. I wish that you who are out there could be in here with us in the newsroom and see the remarkable calisthenics, verbal and physical, and also physiological that have been going on between the engineering department and this particular booth in which I find myself. You see, we have channels open to London. We are so eager not to miss any of Merrill Miller's broadcast for you that we are constantly monitoring the channel. And the purpose of that is that the instant that we know that he is coming through, that I can stop my verbal peregrinations and that you can be transferred to the real front line to get the first-hand reports. So I hope that you listeners will bear with us in our efforts to do the best we can under circumstances that, as you can well understand, are sometimes a little difficult. Let me summarize in these next two minutes just about what the situation is. Beachheads, firmly established at at least 
two points. Greater success than we had anticipated in the original lending operations. Losses thus far remarkably light. Our preliminary bombardment very definitely successful in eliminating German air power, in eliminating German artillery power along the coast. Here is a bulletin from Naples. Premier Marshal Pietro Badoglio dissolved his Italian government today and was charged by Crown Prince Umberto with forming a new government to include political leaders in liberated Rome. The purpose, as you see, to broaden the Italian government to include those prominent men who have been isolated from the Italian political situation through being in Rome itself. A further step in the democratization of Italy. We are, because of the capture of Rome, developing a new situation in Italy itself. And even as we succeed in Italy, our landings are succeeding on the coast of France. Thank you very much, Mr. Caltonborn. Ladies and gentlemen, we're still attempting to contact Merrill Miller in his position with uh, General Eisenhower's headquarters, so if you stay tuned to your present NBC station, as soon as we can, we'll bring it to you. This is the National Broadcasting Company.